Order, the Thursday, May 24th, 2018 meeting of the City of Northampton Planning Board. Uh, we'll begin, as we do every meeting, with a public comment period. I just want to clarify that this public comment period is this for anything that's not on the agenda. I know there are people here for things that are on the agenda, but that, will, that public comment will come later. Uh, so this is just if it's for something that's not on the agenda. Seeing no takers. Um, we have a presentation by some visiting fellows, the Young Southeast Asian Leadership Institute Fellowship Program. Jean Palma, visiting from the Philippines, and Faye, Price. and I will not even attempt your last name. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, you can clarify for us when you speak. Uh, visiting from Thailand, so the floor is yours. Okay, so um, good evening. Uh, so I'm Jean, and she's Faye. And we're going to uh, give a presentation, the final presentation of our learnings from the professional fellowship program of this uh, from YCD Department of State. So the program is. Can I just sorry? clarify? When you yeah. say professional, it means you are working. Yes, we are working. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, so about the program, just briefly, it's under the Department of State, and it's a six-week program where we are placed with cities and we are here for the environmental sustainability track of the program and fellows who uh, come to the United States from Southeast Asia are um, expected to create impact community challenges when we go back home to our countries. There are currently 20 fellows across the country and we are distributed in um, different states and we were the lucky ones to come to Northampton in Massachusetts. Um, a little bit about Southeast Asia. This is our region of the world and a little bit of fast facts. There, there are 10 countries in this region with a 641 million population. We are composed of Indochina, which is the mainland Southeast Asia, and the islands, which is the maritime Southeast Asia. And we're a very tropical, humid region, and we have intergovernmental uh, relations through the ASEAN or ASEAN uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So I'll turn this over to Fai. We are, these are our two countries um, for her experiences and learnings, then I will follow. Oh, oh sorry. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm so excited <laughs> to be in front of you here. OK. Uh, my name is Pimpawati Deyangkun. I am a visiting fellow from YCD program, as Jean mentioned you before. The program is organized by ICMA and hosted by the city of Northampton. I spent my fellowship here for four weeks, and with my co-fellow, Jean, it is a wonderful time in my life. Okay, well, I will, uh, I will tell something about myself. I am a PhD student in Thailand. I study environmental engineering. With this background, I always concern on environmental issues, especially size limitation, waste management, hazardous waste, and waste to energy. Yes, this is my hometown. You can see in the in the map. Chiang Mai is the north of Thailand. Recently, urban planning and green spaces become to be my interest because of the situation in my home country, Thailand, and especially in Chiang Mai. Yes. Chiang Mai is the second biggest city which is located in the north of Thailand. It's growing faster within the last decade. This is the picture of Chiang Mai. It's a beautiful province in Thailand. Yes. Due to the beauty and the old culture, Chiang Mai is a popular destination for many tourists around the world and also people move from other city and settle down here. You can see that in the graph, the number of population increased so fast in the last 10, ye 10 years. Chiang Mai expand. The proper management is not good enough, but we're still working on it, but it's slowly. We have to speed it up. Urbanization is good, but in another way, it leads to many enrollment environmental problems such as transportation, waste and wastewater management, and also the pollution. Yes, and <laughs> <laughs> the public in the space are limited. Uh, 
I believe that one thing that people has a right to live in a good environment. This problem should be solved together with the development. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. That is a sentence I have a strong agreement with. It is learning from others' experience is the best. Therefore, that's why I'm here. Compared to Chiang Mai, Northampton is a small city, but uh, Northampton has a good management. I have a lot of impression about this city. I will show some of those impressions and what I learned here. My first impression was at the first day we arrived. We start with the bike festival. At that event, we didn't have a bicycle yet, so we walk. <laughs> so we walk. Yes. I questioned myself that what's what's a long tail it is, but it's just a part of the trail. After that, I have learned a lot from many people. Northampton has a very long trail for walking, biking, except from the car and auto vehicle. You can use the trail for going for to your workplace and having relaxed time, exercise, and meeting some people there. It is good for people and public. Air pollution and energy consumption decrease. I love that trail really much. Mm. <laughs> usually, I usually spend my free time on the trail. Yes. My second impression about Northampton is there is many, many beautiful parks and parklets. The city provides green space for people and share it for everyone. It's a, it's a good benefit. Yeah. And I have to mention about the participation between city and people. I have many opportunities to join the meeting, workshop, and also activity. Every event is my lesson learned. The city connect with the people, such as in this commission. Uh, the city provide the opportunity for them to share their opinion and discuss about them, about that. And I love the volunteer activity here. This is the meeting, the youth committee meeting with Susan White. But most, I impressed it because of most of the members are elder and retired. They, they volunteer themselves for the youth project in their community. I'm happy to see their, their energy. Their knowledge is useful and apply for creating the good thing for their community. All of that bring me to my community challenge plan. The concept of my plan is edu education come first. We, we have to make it happen. We have to make it fun, enjoy about it for, uh, for the good cooperation. I will set a workshop to motivate people and let them realize that what is our problem in the state one. And then in the step two, we will create and build up the multiplier expert to provide more knowledge about that. And then repeat it again. It's like a loop. Yes. Last but not least, for my for me, yes. I'm thankful for your warm welcome. Make it like home for me. Your experience you share to us is worthy. A lot of things I get from you will apply to my home country. Our fellowship here is fulfilled. And thank you so much. Now that is the intern. I don't know if I can top that, but <laughs> um, okay. So um, my project is place making in public spaces. Uh, let me. Okay, that's that's me. I'm an environmental planner in Metro Manila, and my fields of focus are revitalizing public spaces, and that's why I was placed here in the city because of the great efforts for 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 bicycles and pedestrian and inclusive spaces and post-disaster and post-conflict rehabilitation with the World Bank. Um, this is my country, it's the Philippines, so just a few uh, fast facts. We are the first country to welcome the hazards in the waters and winds of the Pacific. We are a 110 million um, population country, a democratic republic with 7,000 islands. Um, Okay, those are uh, at least 7,641 of them, um, which uh, requires environmental and urban planners to approach planning with the reach to reef um, orientation. 
because urbanization is affecting the country very badly with many, many consequences. We have 22,554 miles of shoreline, so imagine the scope and the number of areas and islands that we have to plan for. Uh, we are a mega biodiverse country, just some things you can see uh, with mountainous terrains that are homes to our northern tribes and vast seas and reef areas that are home to our sea nomad tribes. They, they live in the water, they swim more than they walk. <laughs> um, but city life is a different story from the beautiful islands of the Philippines. Um, this is where I live, this is Metro Manila. and. Uh, it's the national capital region of the country. We are a 15 million population metropolitan, and the density is um, 53,000 people at least per square mile. That is how fast we are growing, and we are one of the most populous urban areas in the world. Um, that's my house, just to give some context to the problem. And why I'm learning here, I had to uh, move to a condo to be closer to work. 11 miles is at least two to three hours of traffic in my place of the world, one way. Um, it should be 15 to 20 minutes, but because of lack of spaces and connectivity and mobility, that's what we have to go through. And I'm not exaggerating, that is every day. That's what I have to go through every day to go to work and back. And um, lack of discipline from people doesn't help. <laughs> Uh, that's our normal scenario, and yes, there we go. <laughs> that's what we look like. Uh, they're not really, you know, colliding. That's just they have one centimeter of space in between, and that's the talent of Filipino drivers. Um, and nor the lack of pedestrian spaces. We do not have the sidewalks that I enjoy here in Northampton, um, nor the parks. Um, that's where I live. I walk here every day, <laughs> and um, our major highway. And we have waiting lines like these to get to the train. And if we don't get the train, we go to the shuttle waiting lines. That's urbanization, Southeast Asia. That's our train system at the bottom. You can see Manila, <laughs> a little bit of trains. Um, and we, this problem, I think, is growing in most of the major cities in Southeast Asia. We exchange the few remaining green spaces for malls. This is similar to Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur and so on, because developers have, the, have their way for profit. So there's a joke that our biggest open spaces are now exclusive to our president, the dead, the mentally ill, the golfing elite, and the military. <laughs> Those are our parks, mm. and not for the public. So, And our cities, um, Joe took us recently to see the Connecticut from Sugarloaf Mountain, and it was beautiful, but sadly that's what we see from our <laughs> river, for, uh, on our rivers. So. Uh, I'm getting theory here, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And we have a lot of issues to address urbanization-wise, but population continues to grow, and that's why I'm working on the public spaces. This metropolitan has grown to be a mega city, growing fast to become like Mumbai and Tokyo. And um, we are a developing country, so the opportunities to address the environment are um, way below the priorities of poverty access to clean water. No, we do not drink from our faucets. We have to buy bottled water every day. And uh, lack of education. Um, this, uh, le this young lady at 19 years old has three kids and has begging, uh, been begging every day for the past two years that I've lived in the financial district. Um, and too bad our political leaders get along, but I won't say too much on that anymore. <laughs> um, and that's why I have to be working on the public spaces. My vision is to transform something like um, to the left is our uh, one of our most dangerous streets in the country, to something that is livable. And um, Wayne and Joe from the and the whole planning uh, department and everyone we've met here have been very good mentors on how we can um, take many elements of what we learn here and replicate and pilot them back home. Um, so my community challenge is to do placemaking in our public spaces. So it goes through site selection of different spaces from streets to parks to smaller par uh, smaller areas or spaces, uh, walls, murals, etc. cetera, um, potential, er potential areas for gardens and so on. And create these with the community so they have ownership. Um, some expected challenges. Uh, please tell me if I'm going too long, by the way. Um, so uh, awareness and um, car-centric um, orientations, heat and extreme humidity because rain gardens um, or plants and many uh, sustainability efforts here may not be applicable. So we, we have to localize multi-hazards that we experience and political will. Um, 
So I'm just going to go through our um, portfolio or list of what, what we've learned here and what we've appreciated. So those are the parks, parklets, and recreational spaces. Um, trails, we love the Rails to Trails program of the government. Mm, bike share, <laughs> amazing. Uh, usable spaces, this really amazed me. Students practicing chemistry in the sidewalks. We don't get that because our houses are right next to the streets. We have no buffer, uh, simple ways of just creating bike lanes through painted areas. Um, city maps and historical facts, which can, can give directions to our communities, meaningful murals, um, pollinator gardens, which really fascinated us. Um, rain gardens, so effective. Um, edible plants for everyone, which can also help address the uh, poverty issues back home. Garms, plant facts. City history, something we do not talk about in our area of the world. Uh, inclusive spaces, this this we appreciated very much. And movable chairs, better markets, and that's that's just a collage of people we've met over the course of the month. Um, and some observations in the fellowship, we think um, for the city of Northampton, the volunteer and advocate groups are a big strength of the city. Um, that's something we don't have back home. Everyone here just seems to be able to, you know, participate. I think everyone's here <laughs> to give comments, to participate, and to be part of the decision-making process. We don't have that. We we are very know, embarrassed or shy to talk or scared because of the political agenda. Um, environmental advocates easily get killed in our country, so um, something we have to move towards, you know, um, improve that. Uh, wide, widespread awareness and sustainability going to UMass, Met College, Hampshire, HGE. Um, amazing implementation of the solar, hydro, and clean energy, and so many other things. Um, it's our first time to see all of these, by the way. Conservation of history is great, um, inclusiveness, um, and so on. So, new things we learned so, reuses of space, um, making. Uh, shifting the concrete and inefficient buildings to living and breathing ones, campus sustainability, uh, yeah, volunteer group services, uh, shifting, uh, road narrowing. I posted this the section in front of the city hall on Facebook and it got like 20,000 views on Facebook because uh, they said, wow, they're narrowing roads because we just know how to expand their roads, so it's so different. Um, collaborative local governments, day one here, East Hampton and North Hampton mayors were biking together. It's, it's amazing. Um, awareness on climate specific issues. We, we were forced to talk about snow and we do not know what snow is. <laughs> Invasive species, we take that for granted because our plants are so resilient. They just, you know, they just thrive. And we learned how to eat bread and waffles as breakfast for a month, you know, not rice. <laughs> and that's it. And salama, kapun ka, and thank you. That is our presentation. Thank you to the city of Northampton. Are we allowed to ask questions? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come with me, you answer the question. <laughs> um, I'll ask the first one. I'm just curious, um, with so much coastline um, in the Philippines, mm. um, have there been any recognition or steps taken around sea level rise? Uh, yes, uh, the climate change and disaster risk adaptation measures are embedded into our planning manuals already. Um, there are many mitigation measures uh, for uh, mangrove planting as one, and um, con good urban management would, would really address that. And um, there, ha there have been conversations to talk about the, way the plastic and the, the cleaner energy, but we have to push more for legislation so that sea level rise and other impacts of climate change would not, you know, we, we would be the first to experience it. We would lose our island. So. We're, we're getting there, but nowhere near the implementation here. <laughs> we have to have our policies in place first, yeah. Questions from the board? Or the audience? No. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the 7 o'clock proposed zoning amendment 350-6.3 public road takings, legal non-conforming and conforming impacts. Um, so I 
e emailed this ordinance. I do have extra copies. They printed on 11 by 17. <laughs> <laughs> big text. Um, so I thought I there was a comment on our age or something. <laughs> um, so this ordinance is um, really about um, pass this down. This is also um, shows a red line. Extra copies in there. Red line version that slightly modified from um, when it was originally submitted to city council. But the idea behind this change is we have a section in the zoning that allows for um, different consideration or reduction in um, setbacks and frontage requirements uh, depending on different scenarios um, or planning board special permit approval. But the idea behind adding this subsection um, is um, to address issues with, that um, are created for parcels that might be conforming, but then if there's a roadway improvement that then eats into the property lines of, of, a, of a parcel that makes it non-conforming, that this would sort of allow that property owner to um, continue having a complying lot instead of sort of taking that in addition to you know, roadway expansion or sidewalk expansion on the property. So if a lot becomes non-conforming, not by anything of their own, but by right. public domain, right. they shouldn't be then punished a second time by, quote unquote, by being now becoming non-conforming. Right. Okay. So the idea is to that this is for um, land that is currently legally conforming. Um, and if it becomes newly non-conforming, that um, so long as it maintains a minimum lot size of um, 3,750 square feet and 50 feet of frontage, um, which is a, a minimum lot size based on our urban residential districts for a single family home. Um, and frankly, the state also has a, a single, what's called a single lot exemption for lots that have a minimum of 50 feet of frontage. Um, and in that case, uh, 5,000 square feet. But, um, and then also uh, maintains a 10-foot setback that, um, from the property lines um, and that the remaining lot is in a commercial, if it's in a commercial industrial district, the 10-foot setback is um, a measurement from the building or parking lot, whichever is closer to the front lot line. So it's trying to address um, a, a applying minimum standards, but allowing that um, leeway for taking, for roadway takings. And so what's before you, so as a, um, because it's a zoning change, the planning board has to hold a public hearing. The city council legislative um, matters committee will also be holding a public hearing. You would vote to make a recommendation to the full council. Legislative matters also um, will ho host a public hearing and make its recommendation to full city council. So. Um, this is one of the required steps for any for a zoning change. But we do need to make a recommendation tonight. Yes. yes. Okay. Can I ask two questions? Does this protected non-conforming status exist anywhere else in our zoning? Um, not for not for public takings of property. We do allow a reduction of dimensional and density regulations in the zoning. Um, in instances where, um, for example, the one that has come up probably more frequently is um, if a property owner is um, proposing a development and then um, is offering to give open space to the city, mm -hmm. there's a provision in the code that the planning board can approve a special permit mm -hmm. for a reduction in lot size for the purposes of donating that land to the city. So it's sort of parallel to that. Um, it's not brand new. It's not a brand new concept. And then on the effective date, are we? What's the rationale for backdating to January one? Well, it could be any. It could be. It's an. It's an easy date to come up with. Yeah. But instead of saying the date that this is adopted, which we don't know what date that will be, um, it's just a definitive date. So basically, we're not going to go back in time right. um, since the beginning of when roadway construction started is there a downside to waiting until January 1 2019 um, I guess the only downside is um, 
you know, if the if city council adopts it in July or something, then it would take six months to come into effect. Alan, I don't, I don't understand the rationale for the three exceptions. Um, for instance, what if there was a legally non-conforming lot that had four thousand square feet and four hundred square feet were taken? So they wouldn't have the 3750, and they would lose their ability to use their property through no fault of their own. Well, then um, um, I think the idea is to create a minimum so that you have some lot size that is um, going to be at least there's a standard um, size for a parcel. If it were an example where you're taking almost all the land, then that becomes an issue for DOT or the city in the taking that the compensation would then have to take into effect that you no longer have a viable or usable parcel. So then that would be um, mitigated through the amount of payment. Though, if, it, it seemed, if I'm understanding what Alan was asking, uh, it seems. I think it seems like the other way. What if it's not a? It's not taking most of it. It's only taking enough that it pushes it under the limit. That would still be. But part that of would still be your argument yeah. to okay. DOT. Right. Like now you're making my law. Okay, so it doesn't. So yeah. the amount of it that they're taking is it's just that you've pushed it under the limit and now you've changed the nature of mine. Right. Okay. Right. 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 Other questions from the board. Does this happen? When has this happened? It happens on occasion. So, for example, um, probably the most recent project, which goes back now 15 years, is Route 66. Um, there was that was a there was there were significant road widenings that happened for that project. We're about to embark on um, we meaning the Commonwealth <laughs> um, to. Um, make modifications to Damon Road. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't happen a lot, but um, yeah. on occasion, yeah. We, there are takings almost every year. Most of them don't have a big effect on the value, but there's lots of, you know, every time there's a storm pipe that gets put in and dumps in someone's property, we have to take 10 square feet. So there's several of these a year, most aren't affected because they're a simple easement, but there's something going on. Any questions on the Any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, I would entertain either a, mo a motion of any type. Public Second. Second by Tess. All in favor? Any other comments or questions on the board, or anyone would like to make a motion? I make a motion to pass the. You ordinance? Is to recommend. To recommend the council. Recommend. Okay. Yeah. Recommendation. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Passes. Okay. I know you're worried. We now have a hearing for special permit for Deborah Henson, bed and breakfast, 83 Pomeroy, Pomeroy Terrace, Northampton Map ID. 32A-221. Deborah? I am Deborah Hinson. Okay. Would you like to give a presentation? Yeah. Um, I don't have as fancy a presentation as they did. <laughs> I just am happen, just here and, and new to town. Uh, fell in love with 83 Pomeroy Terrace. Um, think it would be a great bed and breakfast. Um, it's within walking distance of downtown, so people can come and visit. They can be here for colleges, they can be here for tourist activities, and they can take advantage of all the downtown restaurants, coffee shops, and whatnot, and all the, the beautiful land around here. I'm, I'm in love with Northampton, particularly in the spring. I got here at the end of February. It was a little brutal then, but um, it's wonderful now. And uh, the house is lovely. Um, I just think that the the best use of this house, a lot of the houses I've noticed in walking around, a lot of these older Victorians have been subdivided into, I don't know, condos, apartments, whatever. And I think that's probably a great use for them as well. 
but this house is a single family with um, an upstairs third floor apartment, for lack of a better word. It's really kind of a, not a viable apartment, since, but it's a, a shared house share, second, third floor apartment. University of Massachusetts student, grad student has been living there. She came with the house. So <laughs> she's, um, she's delightful. But I do think that having people be able to come and stay in a couple of the rooms, and, and again, it's just a small, a small endeavor, really. It's not a big hotel like the Autumn Inn or anything. It's two rooms, kind of family style, bed and breakfast, beautiful lot, beautiful home, and I'd like to keep it kind of in, in its ilk. It's been in many iterations, I understand, from the previous owners. It used to be a three-family. Then it was a two-family, so it depends on what year you look at it, what, how many families live there, but this would be people coming in and out and just enjoying the community. There's plenty of parking, so I understand generally parking is an issue. There's plenty of off-street parking. Um, and I don't, I don't know what else, if you all have other questions. It has you know, a beautiful wraparound porch. People can sit out there and enjoy the, the surroundings and, and walk every place they want to walk, so that's, been, and it's, oh, it's zoned correctly. I mean, you, you know that, but uh, that, that was, I think, two of the issues, the zoning and then the parking. So I'm just here to ask for that special permit. Any questions from the board? What kind of improvement are you doing? Change anything existing structure? Did I, did I change? Yeah, yeah, I mean. Yeah, well, the, what I did is I changed, there was a half bath on the second floor, so the, the guest rooms would be on the second floor. I have a bedroom and an office in two of the bedrooms, or four total on that second floor. There was a half bath that, was, that you got to from the hallway. I wanted to open that and create that to be, and make that and turn that into a full bath, and I uh, did a, an entrance from the bedroom into that bathroom so that the person who is staying there, you know, a Smith student for the summer or somebody coming on a shorter term basis could have their own private bathroom, not have to come out of their door, down the hall, and basically into a half bath. I wanted them to be able to have a full bath with private access. So that was one of the things I did. The previous owners had the large bedroom at the very back, which used to be the kitchen when it was a three family. That second floor was one family, and at the very back of the hallway was a kitchen. The previous owners converted that to a laundry room, like it was a washer and dryer, very nicely done, but, you know, upgraded linoleum called marmoleum. I learned about that, and um, washer dryer and whatnot. I wanted that to be a guest room because there's a beautiful bathroom that the previous owners put in. So I took out the closets, moved the washer and dryer downstairs, and converted that to a bedroom, put carpeting in rather than linoleum. And um, so that's a bedroom, and it has its private bath. So the two proposed guest rooms each have private baths with them. You know put locks on the doors, all that, all that good stuff that people want when they go. I've, I've been a, you know, a traveler and a bed and breakfast person when I go visit my kid in Boston or whatnot. And so I like that kind of feel of staying in somebody's home. So, and then I think the, the only the other thing I did was move the washer and dryer down. I had many inspectors. I've gotten to know all the inspectors here in Northampton and they are very delightful and they come frequently so the washer and dryer <coughs> got moved downstairs. They had to put new plumbing in for that and electricity and all. So it's not really a big change in infrastructure? It wasn't a change, no, no. Okay. Other questions from the board? Are there issues with the assessment, with it being assessed as a two-family versus? It depends who you ask. <laughs> but the assessor has come and visited. Okay. Yep. The, um, Mark, it is, I believe, with uh, works in the assessor's office was out a few weeks ago. I wanted to wait till after we finished all the construction stuff, so he didn't have to breathe all that and just see what it looked like. And so he came out and looked at it, and I don't know. So to answer your question, I don't know. I don't think they can consider it 
Well, they, I guess according to the assessor, it is two family because they said that by definition with the state, if it's <clears throat> how many kitchens you have. So that third floor apartment has a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And at, some, at one point, there were three kitchens in the house. Now there are only two kitchens, so they consider it a two family. But, I, but the appraiser, when I was buying the house, did not consider it a two family because there's no separate egress. There's a shared entrance. So the appraiser said, no, it's not a two family. It's a single family with a sh shared suite or something. I don't know. I don't know what they called it, but so it kind of depends who you ask. <laughs> so we're changing, I mean, other than she's running a, a business out of it, I mean, what kind of change is there to this house? There's, there's nothing really changing to that. It's just the use and the request for um, uh, officially to become a bed and breakfast. Okay. Oh, and I did, one other thing, I did ask the neighbors, I, I've included my letter in there kind of as a way of introducing myself to the surrounding neighbors. I think I distributed about 20, 21 letters, my dog and I roamed around. And um, a couple people did write, a lot of people verbally told me, oh, we think this is a great idea. A couple people wrote in. Most people, I guess, don't kind of take the time to write in, but I asked them. And so two people wrote emails, said that they, they thought it was a great idea. Um, my very next door neighbors, kind of on the Hancock side. So Pomeroy Terrace curves, and then it becomes Hancock. And the people that have the driveway right on that side of the yard, at, they sent me a very long email asking me to move the table and chairs that I had <laughs> in my yard <laughs> because they did not think it was a good idea for my guests to sit there where they could like walk out and see them. Like, I don't think we're going to run like a nudist colony or anything, but anyway, they were a little concerned I think about the zoning it. allows for that. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does. Oh, good. Well, so I moved the table and chairs and I haven't heard anything from them, but you know, I'm trying to be accommodating. I'm going to have an open house June 23rd, you know, whether I'm an official b, b or not, I'm still going to have an open house and welcome the neighbors, um, honor all the workers that worked on the house and have them come over with, I guess, Bud Light is the going beverage that they tell me. But anyway, you know, so I guess I can have liquor, right? I can serve liquor. I'm from New Orleans, so, you know, we're used to, like, having little parties. But it won't be many parties. So I wanted to tell the neighbors, not many parties, just families bringing college kids up here. So I don't really think it will be a very loud place. I don't think where there's going to be noise issues. Because um, again, it's two rooms. So at most, we'd have, what? If two rooms were full, I'd have two couples maybe, or you know, three or four individuals. I don't think it's going to be like a big, rowdy B&B. So. Other questions from the board? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Occasionally in your application, you say three rooms. Well, three rooms because because that apartment upstairs, whatever we call it, is actually could be another room, right? I can have up to three rooms, I understand, for a bed and breakfast. And so I said up to, you know, it can be three rooms. So it would be two on the second floor and one bedroom up on the third floor. But I can, but primarily that third floor unit is rented to students, so it's not short-term rental. It is, um, it's basically rented, you know, during the academic year. So what is, so you're applying for bed and breakfast for three? For three rooms. rooms. Okay. Just in case. I mean, let's say. Right. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Just because I think that was the maximum I could have within a single family. So I said, why not go for the max? And then that's, I mean, I have to use them all as bed and breakfast. And you don't have any plans for signage or anything on the building, do you? Um, the previous owners had a have a sign. I was checking with Sarah to find out with the because it's apparently historic registry is in the process. So I was there is a sign that says historic preservation recognition. Now I don't know. I didn't put that sign there. That sign is dated 2007. Previous owners, but in terms of signage for me, I mean, I don't know. I I, I had thought about, well, what if I put Pomeroy in? But I kind of don't want that because I don't want people coming up and knocking on my door. You know, the doorbells I don't think work. I have three doorbells, but well, you know, I don't think they all regularly work. But I don't want people coming and just showing up. So I, I, I'm kind of thinking not 
any signs. People have to come through talking to me to get it to come stay. Any other questions from the board? Any comments or questions from the public on this item? Seeing none, I will. Oh. I, I would just, um, I'm a kind of a distant neighbor around the oh, corner a little further. Okay. And, um, I just think it's a really wonderful use of space for this house. Um, and the, the only possible concern, and it, it doesn't affect you, but maybe just to let your new guests know, is the house is right near the Cutchins property. Mm -hmm. Um, where, if you know it, you, you, I'm sure you know. I'm a about social it now. worker. Yeah, I know. So you yeah. know. So yeah. you know. It, it, they're, these are really troubled kids, as you probably all know. So we, we just want everyone to understand if there's a every well, there a num number of ambulances and police cars that yeah. just come by. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I've asked for in my idea of how I'm going to present this is a quiet hour because not just because the people next door were concerned about where the table was but because I like to sleep too you know and so I'm asking for quiet time between like 10 and 8. It's usually a really quiet area. It's a quiet neighborhood yeah, very quiet. generally but I don't want my guests being you know coming being loud and whatnot so I've, I've if I can just remind you that this is a presentation a conversation between okay. us and you I'm sorry not the, I'm sorry <laughs> and if you could identify yourself and yes, your address Jane Potter 42 Phillips place thank you very much yes. so yeah. so I wanted to have I lose complete control of Good. what's happening that's fine that's fine um, I, I just I do want to have it be a quiet you know I want to be harmonious in the neighborhood and yeah the Cutchins program some of the times the kids yell and that's fine you know I'm a social worker I don't doesn't bother me and I, I don't think my guests are gonna have to so what is our role here this is a special permit, permit. Okay. for bed and breakfast, so you would you have to vote on the application. Okay. For that. Well, I I move to close public comment. Second. Second. Alan, yes. I move to accept her permit to have a bed and breakfast. So the motion is uh, special permit. Prove the special permit request. For Deborah Henson, bed and breakfast, 83 Pomeroy Terrace, Northampton, map ID 32A-22. Do I have a second? Yes, a second. All in favor? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I brought the sign, Carolyn. Should oh. I leave it back here? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's Thank fine. You. Oh, your sign. Um, we now have the uh, special permit major site plan by Scott Carrier, a second curb cut access to commercial access residentially zoned parcel. 5,200 square feet, mixed use construction at 9 West Farms Road, Florence map ID 32-265. And is there a presentation? I think this is going to be continued. Um, so actually, in the just in the last day, the applicant submitted a request to, um, to the board to um, withdraw the application, and they'd like a request to withdraw without prejudice so that they could potentially file again within the next two years. Do we have to approve that? Yes, that because it will be an official decision that will get um, recorded because they've already gone through. So motion to public. approve the rescinding of the application? Is that um, a request that? for withdrawal yeah. without prejudice. Yep. Yeah. Motion to approve the request for withdrawal without prejudice for a uh, special permit at 9 West Farms Road, Florence, map ID 35-268. Second. Mm -hmm. Jenna? All in favor? All opposed? It's passed. Uh, we now will move to other items. Uh, the next item is the presentation of the final open space plan. I assume that is Wayne. Can I see? Is actually Um. So sort of quick background for those of you who haven't been around forever. Um, the city does an open space and recreation and multi-use trail plan every seven years. Um, the plan does sort of two important things for us. One is to build local consensus on what we're trying to do. Um, so the plan is not mandated for anybody, but we go through a lot of boards. We ask you to adopt it. We go to a lot of other boards to ask them to endorse it for their area. Um, and so it's the nearest thing we have a consensus. When we go to buy land, we can go to city council and say, yes, you know, planning board likes this in concept and all the other boards like it in concept. 
Um, so it's very useful for our, for our planning process. The other thing that maybe makes it even more important for us is many grant programs will not fund us unless we have an active open space plan. So this year, for example, we're applying for about a million dollars in funds for open space and recreation. Um, and definitely 600,000 of those require us to have a plan to be eligible for them the last 400,000 months. So it's very important for us to, to do that. I will say those two goals, though, are occasionally in conflict, so I just want to make sure you understand this. Um, this may be much more detailed than you want, but if we were doing a pure planning process, we might well prioritize all the acquisitions, right? We want to do this acquisition, this acquisition. But of course, we don't know when somebody wants to sell land to us, so we don't always go in order. And it's important when I apply for a grant that I'm, I can make it sound like this is the most important acquisition we've ever done. So the plan sort of plays both games, right? It's, it's a real planning document for us. We do not buy open space that we're not interested in. We don't suddenly buy because someone knocks on our door. We turn down a lot of people. But we do go out of order based on willing buyer, willing seller. So it, it is a little misleading in that sense. So let me just run through this. Um, we're almost ready to, to put the plan together. Um, we didn't want to do that till we heard from you all because you're the ones who endorse this or who adopt it. And so I didn't want to be presumptuous and sort of write down the plan for doing it. So I have it, the presentation here to sort of go over it and, and hopefully build consensus if this is what you're looking for. So you know, the plan is, I don't know, 130 pages, 140 pages, 150 pages. The vast majority of that is really boring. Um, so we have to show inventories of every property that we own. It's very important from a um, institutional memory standpoint. So when I was first hired, I got here. They told me, here's the properties we own. I started looking up deeds, and two of them we actually didn't own. No one had ever recorded a deed. So some of this is just that institutional memory. Every single deed, every single you know, title insurance policy, um, lots of demographics. So there's really only about five pages of the plan, and, and the, the goals of the plan, the big picture goals, we steal right out of Sustainable Northampton, because that's a much bigger public process. So what really matters in the plan is about five pages that's the action plan, the 12 actions that we've identified that we want to focus on for the next seven years. So I want to run you through very quickly bragging about the things we've done for the last seven years, not so much to brag, but you get a, a sense of what what the plan governs for us, and then spend the time on those, those 12 goals or 12 action plans. So very quickly, what we've done, and how well you can see this in the slide, but we've been very active in, in all the areas the plan governs. So we've purchased a lot of open space. So we buy land that's parks, we buy land that's recreation, and we buy land that's sort of pristine conservation areas. Um, by far the biggest in acreage is the pristine conservation areas. So when we came before you all as a board 10 years ago, 15% of the city was permanently protected open space. Now 25% of the city is permanently open, is protected open space. And of that 20%, so the majority of, I mean, sorry, 20% of the city, so 80% of the open space, um, is in essence in pristine firm. Now this is not pristine like a national park. We have trails, we have those things, but they're, they're primarily, they, the way we define pristine is they're managed primarily for the resource. We love when people walk or mountain bike or canoe if there's water, but the primary purpose is to preserve the resource and the human use is separate, as opposed to Pulaski Park, right? Incredibly important, but the primary use is people using it. So 5% of the city is Look Park being the biggest part of it, other, you know, other parks and recreation areas and most is conservation. And so you can see from this little graphs here how active we've been going forward. So we had been purchasing for a long time about 180, 100, 100 acres a year. Then we started with the CPA going to about 150 acres a year. And this year, if we, we have a lot of fundraising to do, but if we're successful in fundraising this year, the next 12 months, we're, we're predicting about 250 acres of land. Um, so, you know, a, a substantial amount of land for the city. Um, that's three quarters of a percent um, to a percent of the city 
as open space. Um, so a substantial Wait, piece. Say that again, Wayne. No, so at big. the current point, you know, what we hope to buy this year would be close to 1% of the city, a little bit less than 1% of the city. Um, and of course, I mean, you all know I've been here forever, so I've been here 30 years. So we've been buying half a percent over for, thir you know, for 30 years. So we've been adding a lot. So we had, um, you can see this graph, the, the green in the bottom left, for a long time, the city had a few small purchases, Elwell Island, 100 acres of Fitzgerald Lake, 80 acres or so in Roberts Hill, and then not much else. And then we sort of have been increasing the amount of acquisition that, that's out there. So conservation at the bottom left is the most dramatic. Parks, the upper left. We haven't done a lot. And so these are all scale, different scales. So these are designed to only show within each category. You can't compare them across categories. So parks, we haven't added a lot of land to. Um, recreation areas, likewise, we were flat for a long time. When we bought Florence Fields, we more we basically doubled the amount of recreation, or not including the park, we doubled the amount of recreation areas. Park's a different category. And then we bought the Connecticut River Greenway, we sort of added another 30%. So a lot of recreation areas. Agriculture's a little bit different. Unlike the other areas where the city tries to own the land, in agriculture, our basic goal is the land should remain private. We just want to hold restrictions to stop it from being developed, but it remains private. We own a few acres of agriculture as part of a bigger piece of land. So we own close to 1,000 acres in the Mineral Hills, and it includes 16 acres of farmland because that came with it. But we don't generally, you know, big, we get an individual farm piece, we want to find a farmer to buy it, and we hold restrictions. We did that with Grow Food Northampton, for example, and the 120 acres of land that they own. Um, so active in all these areas. This map is only about city-owned city land that's open to the public. So city conservation land, parks and recreation does not include Mass Audubon, does not include federal land, doesn't include protected land, doesn't include watershed land. So that would basically double what you see before you. So a lot of land scattered throughout town. Um, and then the, what the state wants us to do is an open space and recreation plan because we've been so active in multi-use trails, bike paths. We added that to the plan even though we're not required to do. And a similar thing, the city had one of the first bike paths in, in the Northeast in 1985, roughly, and then we did nothing, we maintained it, but we did nothing in terms of new things until about a decade ago, and then we've been dramatically increasing the system, so we had a three-year period where we added 11 miles of bike paths. Since then, it's been more subtle, but we've done off-ramps at Jackson Street. We extended the path in Leeds last year a third of a mile. This year, we're doing another quarter of a mile. Um, and so a lot of that, that continues to do. We, we, we don't expect ever another 10 miles in any one year, but we expect this sort of trend of a little bit each year. And not surprisingly, when we did that 10 miles, we were buying up all the, rare, the former railroad rights away in the city. So life was easy. Now we're doing cross country and just, it's a lot harder to buy 100 feet here and 300 feet there. Um, yeah. So I assume all this city owned land is off the tax rolls. It's off the tax rolls, that's correct. So doesn't all this wonderful activity significantly impact the tax revenue for the city? It doesn't, so there's three answers to that. First, the, the way Prop 2.5 works is when we take land off the tax rolls, the levy limit, the amount of taxes we collect, remains exactly the same, so everybody's taxes go up, so it doesn't affect municipal finances. It, in theory, affects people's individual bills. We, we, we do the calculation what that is every, year, or every five years we go back, and I don't remember because it's been a few years, but it's about $6, not $6 rate, but $6, in a tax bill per year for the average home. So it's something, but it's not dramatic. And then based on the work that the Lincoln Institute has done, we think we're adding a lot more value to the abutting properties than in fact we're taking off the, the tax rolls. And you see this just quickly, I mean, this is totally anecdotal, this isn't scientific, but if you look at real estate ads, people clearly add, you know, advertise that they're near conservation. So yes, it takes, you know, we take a piece of property that's paying $1,000 a year in taxes, that $1,000 a year is redistributed Again, we've looked at these things, it's relatively small. And most, I keep coming back to Look Park because it's so big, most of the value is in Look Park because it's prime development land, right? We're buying a lot of back land. Um, we certainly buy some land that can be developed. I'm, I'm not saying we're not doing that, but we also, I, I'll show this in a, in a slide in a little while, but we pay a lot of attention to land that we buy 
on what are the ways that we, it has costs in the city. So new roads that require much more maintenance and snow plowing um, cost the city a lot. Um, and, we've tr and, and so a lot of times we're competing for people who might otherwise build new roads. Development along the roads cost the city a lot less. And finally, um, it sort of related to that, we do an assessment. You know, the city census you all fill out every year. That's all public information on, on people above 17. We also get the data on people below 17. And without revealing confidential data, basically every newer subdivision in the city has a lot of young people. And so from a school standpoint, we lose on subdivision. Now, we want to house our population. I'm not suggesting whatsoever that we want to eliminate people, you know, students and young people in town. But from a straight fiscal standpoint, it's a loss leader. And new subdivision costs us money for the most part. Um, but I will come back to that in a little while as well. So um, the other big area you spent a lot of effort on, and you can guess all these things I'm talking about, we're sort of repeating the next seven years in different ways. If you look at our progress over the last few decades, I think we've done phenomenal success on preserving land for all those things, parks, recreation, conservation, bike paths, um, managing property, making it available for the public, meeting our own metrics for how close it is to where people are. The one thing we're sort of losing ground on, and this is true throughout the entire United States, is dealing with invasive plants to a lesser extent than invasive animals. So every year, we have more damage to our natural system from plants and climate change is only making that go faster, right? You, you know, we know we have more ticks, more Lyme disease than we used to. We know so far that no one's gotten diseases, but we have the insect. We're just beginning to get the mosquitoes that in theory can carry Lyme disease, and carry um, uh, uh, Zika virus and Denang fever. We're getting them basically because they, they're laying eggs in tires and the water in tires is a lot warmer than the rest of the area. So it's sort of a leading indicator, right? Mosquitoes that couldn't survive here, et cetera. So, you know, all those things we know we're losing ground on. And that's what a lot of where our focus has been is dealing with it. So we're doing more on invasives. We're doing more on, on, on surveying every property we have, being more professional, marking the boundaries, um, you know, cataloging all these areas. It's left, but Joe Rogers, who was here before, we now have a halftime position who manages our property. Um, you know, when we had 5% of the city, it was easy to manage the volunteers. At 20% of the city, we need a halftime person. So we're sort of making a lot of progress on that. We're paying for some of those things. So Fitzgerald Lake Dam, which is a big capital intrusive project, we used to hire out. Now we do a lot more of that work with our halftime person. So it's actually cheap. You know, we have this halftime person who's sort of paying for themselves and safety. So we're doing a lot of the work in the management piece. One of the metrics that we did seven years ago was creating conservation, or creating open space within walking distance of where most of the population lives. We defined that seven years ago as four tenths of a mile. Um, and so what you see on here is each dot on this map is a person. We mapped. Um, where everybody lives and what's within four tenths of a mile, and almost everybody in town is within four tenths of a mile of some kind of open space. A couple of tiny places that that's not true, but most people have that. I'm going to come back to this later when we talk about what's our metrics going forward. So, so we've met this this important goal for us of, of serving different populations. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that we we did seven years ago is one of our goals was converting unloved pavement to love spaces, right? So this isn't we're not trying to get rid of pavement everywhere in the city, but this little pieces. So. If you're in the Mineral Hills, it may take a thousand acres of land to make a big ecological statement. If you're downtown, it may take 200 square feet to make an important statement. So we have this tiny park in one amber lane that was on city land. We gave permission for Iconica Social Club to build a park there, so they did all the work, but we gave permission. Some you know, right behind this building, behind the Roundhouse parking lot. There's a, um, or behind the roundhouse building, there's a parklet under construction. Um, we have a movable parklet. We move around the city now and play with different places. All this mess in front of City Hall includes a little curb extension that comes out of that program. On Pleasant Street, when we redid Pleasant Street, we created these rain gardens. Not necessarily a place you go and hang out with your child to play, but sort of an attractive interest. So we're trying, we've been having success in that. And that's actually, all that work's been in the last year and a half. So we're moving forward in that. Um, recreation parks, oh, I'm sorry. Obviously, um, 
Pulaski Park is the most dramatic, sort of the total rebuild of Pulaski Park. DPW took the lead on that, both expanding Pulaski Park by about 25% and making it user-friendly. And obviously, you leave here tonight, you see how heavily used it is. Um, Florence Recreation Fields, I mentioned, doubling in size, programming. We finished four phases of construction there. We have one more to go. Um, and then Connecticut River Greenway Park, um, newer park, still needs more work in expanding, but suddenly, for a city that's on two rivers, we had sort of turned our back towards the river for recreation. And this really made a big difference for, for us there. All right, so that's sort of the background. All these things are trends that we look at and say, here's what works, some things didn't work. We try to, we try to learn from what didn't work in the last seven years. And so again, we have 12 goals we're focusing on. I just wanna walk you through those goals. I'm gonna spend more time on the controversial things um, but just go through it quickly. Some is just sort of the detailed things of what is it that planning staff does, that the halftime person we have. The Fitzgerald Lake Dam is still not a totally stable dam. Uh, we need to do some more work on the dam, so we have formal management plans for that. We have sort of completed our goal we set ourselves seven years ago of meeting all the ADA standards that we didn't necessarily comply with but we think there's more opportunities for accessibility. So using the bike paths, for example. The bike path is accessible on Americans with Disabilities Act. My 93-year-old mother can walk about 100 feet before she needs to sit down. There's not benches along the bike path. So we're not in violation of ADA, but there are a lot of populations for whom we don't meet the standards. So we're looking at what are the opportunities for doing that, that kind of work going forward. We've been working with the Disabilities Commission. All, again, this mess out here is part of that collaboration. We got a grant, one of four communities in the state, five communities in the state, to get accessibility grants. Um, we're looking more at agriculture on conservation properties. Um, and it's a challenge. I mean, a lot of our conservation properties who have ag land, it's marginal ag land, so actually we've been losing some agriculture. Uh, just, it's been hard to find farmers, but we're looking for, for potentials. To be, we lose some and we gain some over years. We want to at least focus on that piece. Um, one thing that's sort of one of our you know, exciting projects we think is creating a Northampton One Trail. When you go to Amherst, people say, oh, we have the m m Trail, isn't that great? And people drive to Amherst to hike on the M&M Trail. We think we actually have substantially more trail mileage than Amherst, but we don't have big marquee trails, right? You can hike for days in Northampton. And so we're just sort of thinking of a circuit trail around the city that would connect existing conservation areas and think about the gaps between them um, and you know, put a plaque up that says Northampton 1, um, focus particularly on hardening the trails. You know, we. Our biggest priority is we don't want people to leave the trails to walk through wetlands because the trail gets too wet. So we do trail maintenance partially for users' purposes, but partially if they don't go around the trail. Some parts of the city we have amazing user groups. Some parts we have less of a user groups. So this is all be part of that effort. Um, and again, thinking about invasives, we've had a lot of volunteer efforts. It's been somewhat random. I don't mean that in a negative sense. Broadbrook Coalition, Lathrop Communities have both done an amazing job in invasive control. Um, because we happen to volunteers in those areas. They may or may not be the worst place in the city, just that's where we happen to volunteers. So we want to think about that a little more systematically and then figure out the priorities for that. So that's sort of first, first of our big goals. The second is to continue to buy more open space um, and think about it systematically. Again, we've been doing this for a long time, lots more land. Um, we currently have options to buy about 200 acres of land, and we're negotiating to buy another 100 acres of land. Again, the reason it's an option, not a purchase and sale, this is all contingent on financing, but really important pieces, you know, the, the big marquee one this year is half of Bill Willard Inc.'s property off Burt's Pit Road, beautiful property. We just did Burt's Bog last year, so really important properties. Um, we wanted, going back to Alan's question, we want to continue to think about the fiscal impacts of open space, right? It, you know, I, I gave Alan a somewhat glib answer because we lose on some parcels and gain on some parcels. So I'd rather not give a, an overall summary. I'd rather be a little more sophisticated and, and give bit better answers. Um, there are two competing methodologies in the state, both of which are horrible. Um, uh, American Farmland Trust looks at this average cost of services. They say, what's the total cost for supporting kids and people? and you know, what are their taxes and we lose money on land. Um, but it's not very good because we're, average cost of service doesn't mean much, it's marginal cost that means more for us. Right? So you know, we're already paying for a, a police station. 
if we build a new house, we don't pay for a new police station. And so we need to think about that marginal cost a little bit more. Um, there's some affordable housing groups who do a little bit better job of that, but I think they leave out some cost as well. So we're, we're trying to do a better job of that. Um, working hard at strengthening partnerships, we just signed a memorandum agreement with Kestrel Land Trust to strengthen our partnership for them. We've been working with them for I think, close to a decade, maybe less than that, and we've had more of a sort of transactional relationship. Um, you know, we pay them for services and it's been useful. Um, their fundraising, frankly, hasn't helped Northampton. It's gone elsewhere. We're working with them more in sort of a longer term partnership, right? What, you know, what are the services they're going to deliver that they're going to fundraise for? What are the services that we're going to deliver that we're going to fundraise for? So trying to, to rationalize that a little bit better in the process um, and in, in doing lower some of our costs. Um, again, on the bottom left, you see lots of gaps. I can show you maps of sort of all the places we're trying to fill gaps. We do all the sophisticated analysis. But frankly, if you do a map of Northampton, look where the green is, look where the water bodies are connecting the green, and do, then do a crayon, you can guess pretty much we're trying to connect, right? Connect the green space, particularly along water, particularly along ridges, you know, and then some other things as well. But, um, uh, and then the bottom right, this partially goes back to Alan's question. So seven years ago, city council asked us, what was the goal for open space? How much, you know, when, when did we have enough? Are we doing, you know, 200 acres a year forever? Um, and we said, we don't know, but our goal for the next seven years is to get to 25%. Um, and we reached that. And, and we were clear, this is only the goal for seven years. We're not saying what's it for all time. So we reached that. And so we went back to council as part of discussions, and we said, do you want us to have another goal for the next seven years? Um, the composition of council has changed, and frankly, they're hearing from constituents differently, right? So it used to be we had more political backlash against buying land 20 years ago, and we owned much less of it, than now, where we have, seem to have enormous support for buying land. The bigger concern we've been hearing isn't so much that we're taking too much land out, it's are we artificially inflating the value of land? which makes it harder for Northampton residents to buy homes. So we've changed our metric. We've thrown out a percentage of the city, and now we say, how do we look at building lot creation to make sure there's enough building lots and apartments and condos and, and buildings throughout the city that nothing the city does artificially inflates the value of land? Um, and so you see some that you all know last year when we came before you for Burt's Bog. We preserved 110 acres of land, I think. And in that, we created uh, 12 building lots. Um, when we preserved 50 acres off Glendale Road, we, we created four building lots. Um, and so we're trying to create building lots, albeit smaller than the market will do, so that we can keep this, this line of lots going forward. Obviously, the infill zoning that you all passed a few years, that you all supported a few years ago, was part of that. The state hospital is part of it. So we actually have more single family, lot, family home lots on the market now than we have in years, and we certainly have more urban opportunities and so that's sort of our goal and that's that's in some ways the new metric for making sure that we're not putting too much land in conservation we're being being thoughtful about um, so then um, the next goal and this one sort of covers a lot of areas but I just want to put it in one place is so if open space is prime the big conservation areas are heavily about preserving a lot of land we also want to think about how do we serve the population right? we don't just want pristine areas we put a fence around so how do we serve those areas so the upper left is the metric if seven years ago we said we want conservation area uh, within four tenths of a mile where people live we're now using more of this urban standard you see this a lot in the literature trust for public lands and pushing this or, and some other groups have about having open space from the 10 minute walk of all urban neighborhoods so we continue to use that four tenths of a mile in suburban areas. You know, if I want to live on 100 acres of land on Turkey Hill Road, that's great. But I can't just have conservation land near your house because you'll own it around here. So it's the urban areas we want to make sure everyone's within an easy walking distance, and the suburban areas sort of more spread out. So 10 minutes is our, is our suggestion for that. Again, think about new partnerships. Um, we have some, some partners are really strong, some are weak. Some we have no partners. How do we sort of formalize that? We have a lot of partners, and they're all wonderful in different ways. Um, we have snowmobile trails that we allow in a couple places. Um, and our experience with snowmobile trails is where we have good management groups, we haven't had a problem. And where we don't have good management, we have a big problem. And so the one area, that, the, the Bergie Bullets Trail, well managed. We don't hear complaints. 
Turkey Hill Road, not well managed, we hear complaints. And so we want to say, we're going to, you know, we're happy to continue these two snowmobile trails, but they have to both be managed. Bergy Bullets again already there. Turkey Hill Road really saying we're going to reconsider having this as a snowmobile trail if we can't address that. Um, hunting, which I suspect is the most controversial part of the process, and a couple of slides I'm going to come back to. We had this identical discussion seven years ago. The plan seven years ago said the Conservation Commission should figure out what makes sense for hunting and what doesn't make sense for hunting, and not much happened in the seven years. So trying to move that conversation forward a little bit and what makes sense and what doesn't, again, you see in the slide. Um, more of a focus on environmental justice populations. This is the Massachusetts term for low-income, minority, non-English speaking neighborhoods. So we want everyone to be in the walking distance of open space. But if, I'm, if I live in River Run, I am literally 50 feet from a large conservation area, but the River Run trustees wouldn't allow us to build a trail to connect River Run to the conservation area. And so 16-year-old kids wander through the dense woods, but most people doesn't use it. So just drawing distance from the map doesn't mean much if you can't actually get there. And so thinking about particularly for those populations with a low rate of car ownership. So when we were doing the early phase of design for Damon Road, we had Smith College students go out and take pictures of Damon Road on what we call desire lines. And you could see in the middle of winter when it was pure ice, the people who were walking through the ice on, on, you know, behind the guardrail because they didn't have an option to get somewhere. And so we want to be particularly careful if those people don't have options. How do we make sure we provide some parks and recreation that's out there? Um, we have one area called the Jeep Eater Trail. It's the one place that had a long history of a Jeep trail when we acquired the property. We said at the time we acquired, when we acquired it, we're OK tolerating this again as long as it's well managed. It's mostly worked out, but not totally worked out. And we basically want to do the same thing for them that we've said for snowmobiles. You have to do a better job of keeping, it's an area that's basically pure rock. Where, and they're not where is that? On Sylvester it, Road? It's on Sylvester Road. Just, just right. you get to the rise of land. And basically we want to say is, look, if you keep people getting back on the trail, it's great. We are seeing a wider, more people leaving the trail and going through the mud, and that creates problems. So that's city-owned land. I've always wondered. The first that. third of it is. Then it goes on to private property that's not ours. The first half, I'm not exactly sure the, the distance. The, part, the rocky part you see. The rocky part, road. basically up to the height of the land is ours, and then it starts dropping down. I'm not exactly sure the boundary, but then it goes through there. Um, and we have some users who are great. They, they took several truckloads of trash out last year. Um, so there's some really wonderful, very responsible users, and there's some who are less responsible. And, and so we really want to say, you, you know, you got to stay on the rock. That, that, that was the rule for doing it. Um, so sort of all those areas are, are serving the population. They want to talk about hunting because it's, I, I will say, you know, open space plan covers a lot of things. Uh, you know, I spent basically about 20% of my time implementing the open space plan. Um, and it covers a lot of things, and I would say 95% of the comments we heard were about hunting. And in particular, in most areas we heard comments, there was clear consensus, right? So we have a bias not towards any outcome, but towards building community consensus. Hunting was the one area where, frankly, consensus eluded us, right? The, the hunters had very strong feelings. The people who didn't want hunting had very strong feelings. And we sort of put out trial balloons on trying to fit, find a middle ground. We couldn't find it. Um, it may be there, but we couldn't find it. So it, so it has some attention here. So in just sort of the quick history, the plan seven years ago said we should identify areas for hunting. Um, wasn't a lot of effort. There's some public hearings, very controversial at the time. Conservation Commission with City Council approval ended hunting at one area at Broad Brook, um, allowed bow hunting at one area that's difficult to get to, so doesn't have a lot of pedestrian use. Um, and um, that was sort of that basically was the action. So we're sort of trying to think of what's the framework. The plan's not going to make final recommendations about hunting because the plan, again, is big consensus level things, and the Conservation Commission managed the property and it's up to them. We're trying to figure out where's the framework, and at least we're testing where is their consensus and where is their not consensus. Um, and so I'm basically going as far, yes, and there's no consensus in anything, but I'm trying to go as far as what it seems like maybe there's, there's some consensus in the process. So in terms of the, the framework, so the first one is what we heard most clearly is the areas that have high visitation and have residential neighborhoods nearby, greatest opposition to hunting, and the hunters who wanted to open up more areas of town didn't really seem to have strong feelings about where the hunting was, right? They wanted areas in town, but they weren't saying, here's the spot where we need to do it. And so our recommendation, again, this, this, the plan's recommendation is 
that the entire Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake region, um, the Mill River Greenway, Mineral Hills, Parsons Brook, and Soma Hills, all those be taken out or not not be open to hunting. I'm not necessarily I'm not mentioning Pulaski Park. We're not going to allow hunting in Pulaski Park. So there's lots of little places in town that aren't on this list. You can guess, right? You know, wouldn't be legal anyway. Um, so then the list, the area where we just, it's, it's hard to find consensus. As I say, this was the most, the, the community was more polarized than any other issue. I frankly am neutral about hunting. I really don't care whether we are hunting or not. What I wanted to do is find a consensus, and, and I failed in doing that. Um, and you know, the hunters and the non-hunters or the non-hunters in Northampton each feel passionately about it's consistent with conservation values. It serves the city, it's inclusive, it's more humane, and basically they will each make the same argument. You know, it, it's, um, and so there's just no consensus there. So they're the, exactly the same language, basically it shows up in both categories. Um, from a straight environmental standpoint, there's not really adverse impacts of hunting and there's not really significant benefits of hunting. Um, so it doesn't really matter from an environmental standpoint, which is frankly why I'm neutral, because that's, that's the lens I put these things to. Um, ancillary benefits, you know, from, from the hunter's standpoint, we know that deers carry ticks and we know that ticks carry Lyme disease. Now I will tell you, mice are more important than deer. Um, so it's not that if we got rid of all the deer, it's gonna dramatically reduce Lyme disease, but there is clearly a correlation. You look at places with lower deer population, and there's a lower population of Lyme disease. But again, it's so minor, I'm not really making that. That's not the reason we do it. Likewise, for road kills, right? we know the populations get bigger, and they get smashed on the road. When moms kick out their young ones, they, they wander off. Um, and then from that, that's the perspective of the hunters. From the non-hunters, the perspective is the, the obvious misuse. You know? So lots of pictures you can see of everything in the world being shot by hunters. No hunting signs, trees, whatever it is, it's all true. You know, there, there's certainly abuse. You know, I would think it's a minority of hunters, but it's, it's very real. Um, and then the user conflicts. Again, the, the people who didn't want hunting were particularly vehement about safety issues, about gun noise. There was less opposition to bow hunting, but there was certainly opposition to bow hunting from some people. Um, and the hunters basically say the people who hunt with a, a, a shotgun and the people who hunt with bows are totally different populations. So the bow hunters are happy with bow hunting as a, as a compromise, but the shotgun people aren't comfortable with it. Um, and then from hunter's standpoint, yeah, there's lots of land nearby, there's a lot of land elsewhere, but they look at it as a standpoint of, we've been buying 200 acres of land per year, and most of that was open to hunting, and so we're losing basically 200 acres of land of hunting per year. Um, and it's, it's one of the areas we've seen it the most, frankly, is, I'll, we've heard several people reluctant, and in some cases refusing to sell us land strictly because of the hunting, right? They feel it, you know, a bond to the land, so they see the user conflict that's there. So, um, so that's really as far as we got. That, you know, that this is what would go before the Conservation Commission um, as a framework going forward. And then, so it's clear, a plan is only a recommendation. So some point in the future, it'll be up to the Conservation Commission, they'll do public hearings in this process. And they, these are all the options they had before them. They can totally ignore the plan and start over again. We're obviously going to ask them to endorse this plan, but it's not binding on them. So any recommendation is not binding on them. They can play with geographic limits. So I gave you all the things that staff is recommending for geographic limits. There are the other ones as well. They can look at other areas and say it makes sense here. Um, it doesn't make sense here. They can play with seasonal limits. I gather, I'm not a hunter, but I gather there's something you can hunt every day of the year under state law. They can say we're only in it for deer season. We're only in it for two weeks a year. We're only in it for one day. You know, whatever it is, they could do those sort of time limits. They could do species limits, right? We're okay with deer because deer population increases so dramatically, but we don't want to hunt bear. We don't want to hunt whatever it is. They could, they could do any of those things. And then again, the method piece. So those, those are all the things that they get to look at in the process. Um, so then let me just go through the rest. I think the rest goes a little bit faster, but so moving forward, we want to continue to preserve farmland. Mm -hmm. As I said in the beginning, our goal for farmland is restrictions on farmland. We like to keep the farmland in private ownership with what's called agricultural preservation restrictions, again, unless it's part of a bigger piece of land, um, because we think the farmers are better off managing the property than us dealing with that. Um, it's sometimes hard for us to find farmers. Um, we are about to acquire, we got legislation from the state about a year and a half ago to acquire the old Hampshire County Jail work farm. Um, and we, we expect to take title, and then we want to rehab the area. When the jail moved to the state hospital 30 years ago, 
they stop farming the land. And so it has 30 years of growth. There's been a trespasser, which has been great because the trespasser who's been farming the land has kept the land open. But wherever he didn't trespass, the land's been growing up. So we want to rehab that. We got a few thousand dollars from CPA to help start the process. Um, and so again, moving forward, our top priority is the most productive land in town. But what might be important for Northampton from a farming standpoint might not be important elsewhere. And then, of course, we know we have largely been successful, with a couple of minor exceptions off Sylvester Road and elsewhere. We've largely been successful at preserving farmland, either by restrictions, by public or quasi-public ownership, or in the floodplain where nothing can be developed. Our bigger threat, this isn't true nationwide, obviously a lot of farmland is being developed. But in Northampton, our bigger threat is not development. Our bigger threat is farmers saying, it's not worth it to me to farm, and losing farmers. Um, so we have this sort of bimodal distribution of farmers. Um, by far, the majority of acreage is farmer, are farmers who are substantially older than me, who do not have good generational plans. So the potato farmers from Zalowski have a great intergenerational plan, but most of the farmers in the meadows do not have kids who are farming, and the farmers are 65 to 75. So, so we worry about that. And then we have farmers who are closer to my daughter in age, um, who are farming very small plots of land, three acres, five acres. Um, the number of farmers in Northampton has actually been increased in the last 10 years, even when I'm at a farmland has been decreasing. Grow Food Northampton has been part of that. Town, town Farm has been a part. We have other smaller examples. So Abundance Farm, the smallest level. Um, so um, trying to think about if we want to preserve farmland, we have to think about how do we support farmers in the process. And so a, a series of different methods that are out here. Um, one of the ones that's maybe most important, the other thing that's eluded us um, in the process, has been thinking about the meadows. So the meadows has been sort of the hot spot. The farmers would talk about abuse of the farmland. A lot of dogs running through the New Food Security Act makes the standards much stricter for farmers, right? If a dog fouls your field, you can't grow crops out of it. Um, and so it's a huge impact for farmers. Um, and then there's some people who take Jeeps down and drive donuts to the fields and do damage. Um, and so we have a lot of abuse. The farmer's reaction has been to prohibit people from coming in. Most of the, the roads to the meadows are private. They don't allow people to come in. We have a, a place called Rainbow Beach on the river. Gorgeous piece of land, we're landlocked. The farmers have sort of united in saying, we're not going to give you access to Rainbow Beach because as soon as you get access, people then can drive across the fields together. So we've been working with our Ag Commission trying to find a grand compromise. And I'm not, you know, I, I can tell you what we're aiming for. We're aiming for, well, is there a prohibition about dogs? Is there a prohibition to after dusk? Is there a city commitment to fix some of the potholes? It's horrible for farmers driving through. Um, and in return for those things, allowing public access. Again, so far we haven't gotten there, but that's one of the things we're, we're going to try to go forward on in process. Um, adequate land for active recreation. Again, with the, the Connecticut River Greenway process parcel and Florence Fields, we mostly have bought the inventory of land we still want, but we have some gaps. We know Connecticut River Greenway, there's some additional land owned by Lane Construction. We expect that to come on the market in the fall. Um, we're interested in exploring whether that's available. Um, Sheldon Field, you can see this checkerboard pattern of land. We bought land near, checker, near Sheldon Fields that grows up. Some you wouldn't know we own it. We lease it to farmers um, because it doesn't do any good for us, but we'd like to fill the gaps in. Again, no immediate plan to expand Sheldon Field, but we want to build this inventory so if we need it in the future. So again, relatively small amount of land acquisitions, but, but some of them as well. Um, Improving parks and recreation areas. This may be more detail than you care about, but you know, continue to think about playgrounds, continue to think about dog parks, private dog park that you all approved. We want to see what happens with that, but is there still a need for a smaller dog park? Um, a lot of us go crazy when people talk about the state hospital as being a dog park, because it's primarily about agriculture which that's, and open to people. So are there other places that are necessary? Some of our fields are in great shape, like Sheldon, like um, uh, Florence Field. Some are getting tired, and so we need to think about our rotation plan. Same comment I made to you before about accessibility, um, maintaining existing parks and recreation. Again, a new partnership or improved partnership with friends of, of Northampton Parks and Recreation. Um, thinking about winter needs. I'm almost done. 
um, multi-use trails. Again, thinking about how do we continue to expand those trails in maybe three different, four different categories. So just very quickly, how do we think about bike infrastructure um, that builds up everything? So even things that aren't on bike paths help bike paths. June 28th, we unveil our uh, Valley Bike Share Program. And suddenly we hope we're gonna get a lot of new people. We deliberately have pedal assist bikes because we wanna change the demographic. I want people in my demographic and older to feel comfortable riding. Um, and so how do we change that? And we think that, that creates you know, more political constituency for trails. Um, we've done, you see, you see, we now have this four bike share repair, uh, bike repair stations in town, two of which the city did with partners, two of which have been privately. Um, so then big trail expansions, the trail to Williamsburg this year, someday, maybe 20 years from now, but thinking about a trail along the Connecticut River up to Hatfield, thinking about a trail all the way out to um, uh, Ryan, uh, to, uh, uh, Ryan Road School, that we're making some progress on, we're applying for a grant soon. Um, and then just think about access points generally. Big, big expensive access points like Hebert to connect the whole South Street neighborhood and little access points like Blackberry Lane. Blackberry ends like 20 feet before the bike path. People cross there all the time, but it's not technically a connection. So how do we do those, those kinds of things? Um, this is a quick map, we we'll spend time on that. Again, moving forward on our unloved pavement to beloved parks. Think about how do we do that. One of the things we want to do is not just have these random parklets. So, so far, we've been doing great parklets, but they've been somewhat random. How do we connect them together? Think about the, the Freedom Trail in Boston or in, in Providence. There's a blue line that goes from downtown Providence to the water just to tell tourists how to get to the water. You know, do we have some way to connect these things together? Um, you know, so, so think how do we how do we connect them all together? How do we make more trails both in downtown and elsewhere to shorten the walking distance places? Um, and then just honoring history in the landscape. We've been doing some of this. We used to, we occasionally have torn down buildings when we bought land, and we used to just tear them down. Now we do that. We've been trying to keep foundations in place as a memory of the building. We have a farm implement deep in the woods in Beaver Brook. <laughs> And we love that because it sort of reminds you this was all field. You, you walk through and you can't imagine this being a field, and then suddenly the farm, we have an old sawmill, um, you know, tiny portable sawmill in one of our conservation areas. Some of you know we have a coal chute right off the bike path off Earl Street. We want to keep all those sort of memories alive. We want to do better interpret signage interpretation. Um, we just purchased a, a mine, a lead mine. Um, and we're going to sign it carefully because we don't think it's a place for six-year-olds to go and put soil in their mouth. Um, but it's really cool. I mean, you know, they mined lead in Northampton from 1654 until when Galena, Indiana started mining lead and shipping it east, and then we couldn't compete, and so all the mines shut down. But with these mines, the newest one is probably 150 years old, and they're sort of spectacular things. And so you know, doing that, just sort of thinking, we've always focused on natural history. We're trying to, to up the human history. And then the final one is just generally, how do we build public awareness? You know, we used to do brochures, we stopped doing that and switched to web presence. That serves some population, not others. Um, we've had a lot of people really like the kiosk signs we've done along the bike path. Do we do more of that in our conservation areas? We have a pilot grant from CPA to do some of that. Uh, and so we hope to go forward. And, you know, going before lots of boards, you're the one that counts. Every other board is sort of endorsements. You're the ones who formally adopt the plan. Um, and so, um, the goal is I want to get your input now, and then we'd like very quickly to write the plan and bring it back. So I'd like to have as few surprises as possible. I didn't want to do the final part until I hear from you. So this is not uh, final? It's the final presentation. I could easily write this up in a plan, but I didn't want to do that till the till I heard from you all. But what you want from us is input, not a recommendation. Correct. Yet. Okay. Correct. We advertise as a presentation. It'll be in your agenda. So, so you know, there is a, there will be a time pressure on just so you know, one of the reasons I want to get comments. Our plan ran out in March. We can't apply for the next round of grants until we have a new plan. So we want to go forward as quickly as possible, but we needed this first before we do it. Questions, comments from the board before we open it up to the public? Uh, one of the things that I like to see in this, I think, is just a discussion of security uh, in some of the spaces. Uh, you know, I know uh, as a as a father of a young child, one of the things that we were, we were talking about is just how few places have a fence around them for a kid to run around in. 
Um, uh, and then the other part, I mean, uh, to keep it personal, the other day uh, my when my guys were cleaning up one of our yards, we found a, uh, we have a, a couple houses on the bike path, and someone had thrown a needle over the, you know, I think with with this expanded use, which is great, we need to have a little more security so people feel safe. Yeah, I agree. Road. And just just quickly, so we we've, we've done some of that. We used to do a clean up the bike path every year with kids, and we stopped doing that. Frankly, we found a hypodermic needle yeah. um, right off Pleasant Street. Um, so Joe, our maintenance guy, now goes to Sharps training, and, and so we do. So we're very aware of that. And that's very real. Particularly, he spends non an insignificant amount of time cleaning up homeless encampments and conservation areas. That's yeah primary the issue so you're absolutely right um, we've done some in other areas I wasn't involved with the design of but Pulaski Park was deliberately designed to be much more open from the street to improve visibility but I think you're absolutely right with so I can do more we did put fences at um, the field in front of Bridge Street School for exactly that reason so kids could run around <laughs> and not run into the street I personally think the maintenance is a key issue uh, I just moved to downtown I love the West Park right and I've seen things that I don't believe it that are happening and uh, people throwing things. And so I, I just think that we keep on expanding this many spaces, this public space, but how can you keep track of this uh, if that's a concern that you have in, in this whole expansion in my point of mind? Because uh, I always wonder how that can be kept up there. Yeah. I mean, it's easier for conservation areas because they're relatively no, low maintenance. I mean, so we did go from zero staff to a half-time staff after 30 years, but they're relatively low maintenance, and we get more and more volunteer groups. But, you know, there's no question, Pulaski Park, which is gorgeous, we don't have enough staff to maintain the park to the level that we'd like to maintain it. And I think those active ones, you know, um, those active ones are important. I think we sort of think about how do we do that piece. But this maintenance has to do with education too, right? I mean, yep. how can you outreach and kind of bring awareness? Because I don't know. I just I have always second thoughts about expanding public spaces without maintaining it. But um, I, I really think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's a very good plan. But um, I have that issue about maintenance and um, yeah, and safe, right? Is that something that you can actually add more of to discuss maintenance? Yes, we certainly can. I, I want to be honest, where the plan is most successful at bring, is bringing outside resources, at bringing grant resources. Maintenance is not going to be a grant-driven thing. It's going to be volunteer groups and city funds, and the plan just isn't really part of the budget process. So yes, we can strengthen the language in, but it would be dishonest to say, it's not a big factor in the budget process. That the mayor just figure out what can we afford and not afford in the process. But it's the partnerships that we focus more on. So thinking about, you know, Central Park in New York, which is the Friends of Central Park Conservancy. I mean, think about how do we develop those partnerships? That's the part that's really important. We've, and we've done a lot of work, but we need to do more on up and you know, We just had, a, I just reached out to Jim Nash, who's the counselor for the area along Pleasant Street, to say one of the problems we have, you saw a picture of the uh, rain guards in Pleasant Street is when the city plants a new tree, often the immediate butters are the ones who are willing to maintain the tree for the first year where it's really sensitive. The rain gardens are next to apartments that are largely rentals, and we're not finding any volunteers to step forward to maintain the rain gardens. So I reached out to Jim to say, do you have any gardeners in your ward who might want to adopt this area, whether that's picking up needles or pick, picking up the weeds? Um, and I, I don't know if we'll be successful there, but we have successfully generally found a lot of partners going forward. Um, and that goes back to the reason we used to have kids clean up the bike path, was the assumption wasn't just they're cleaning up the bike path, but the theory of if I'm picking up trash, I'm less likely to dump it the next day with my friends. And that's sort of, that's the way we've done education is getting people involved. But, um. Other questions or comments from the board? Wayne, I'm going to delve into what you mentioned more than once was the most controversial t topic as someone who lives on the edge of town near lots of open space. Um, and, I'm, and maybe I'm just, maybe it's been too long a day. I, I'm not quite understanding your, your slide about hunting, no hunting, and the framework. So 
Again, this will be a separate process after the plan, because the plan really was designed to be just what are the things we could build consensus on, and everything else we have to push off later. Okay. So my suggestion for CONSCOM, and your suggestion if you adopt this, is we just clearly say we're not talking about these five big areas, right? No hunting in those areas. They hit all those, the different areas. Um, and then, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's the balance in these other areas? What, you know, is there, do they want to say, and they could certainly say this, and again, I don't have, have a preference, do we want to ban hunting totally? Do we want to identify some areas for hunting? Um, and just sort of thinking about being thoughtful about what, you know, what are the issues? And so I just try to highlight the issues. Okay. Like, you know, what's humane, what's sort of city? You know, I think I, my argument is those issues of humaneness and conservation and ecological values, we really shouldn't be talking about because I think it's pretty clear that it's not an impact. User conflicts are, to me, the total legitimate issue. Um, well, I, I guess it just, I mean, and I don't know, maybe there's other guidelines for this, but it, it seems like safety would be a, a primary issue yeah. uh, as someone who lives, again, on the edge of town. Um, that would be largely addressed by some kind of standard, you know, no hunting within, I don't know what, how far, I don't know what, um, shotgun will go, but, you know, maybe twice that length <laughs> or a bow or, you know, I mean, yeah. just something that, you know, so there's kind of a standard for everywhere, and then there might be particular areas that are no, not at all, but because so I, I, I think it, to me, if you leave open places that aren't addressed, that's where it, it seems like you could end up having conflict between two different user groups. If, if you if you kind of have some basic rules that apply everywhere, then it seems like you've got you know if I as a homeowner or a family member have a you know have a confrontation with another user, yep. I can say well you know the rules are these at least you know at least you can all agree on these are the basics kind of thing. So I, I don't know. It just seems like leaves kind of a lot unspoken as opposed to saying, well, here's kind of some basic rules that apply everywhere. Uh, that's just, you know, my own. Right. No, I think it's totally legitimate. I mean, I will say my own bias is that those, whatever those lines are, have to be clear geographic features. Right. Because otherwise people are going to argue, yeah. Know, oh, yeah. there's I mean, a river, yeah. there's whatever it is. But yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Um, yeah, and so and I want to be clear, in listing five areas which we're saying no hunting, this is not to imply that all the other areas should have hunting, but that they're more complicated. And some well, of the areas and I think that's and I think that's where the, the like you said, that's where the complication comes in, is because you have identified these. Well what about the ones that aren't identified? Right. And I think that's where you're gonna run into, you know, right. um, user. And, and but what I hope this does this is this isn't to say this is what we're Conscom will do. It's to narrow the issues. So suddenly people in Broadbrook area say I'm not worried about this area so we're having you know we, we have fewer areas right. we've never heard pushback for example about hunting in Rainbow Beach so maybe we have some areas where there's no debate because we you know so yeah. we get it down and Conscom will have a four-hour public hearing at some point yeah. and, and bait things out but at least they don't have to address some things we've addressed already that's not to say that we want a four-hour public hearing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a goal to shoot for <laughs> Any other comments or, or questions from the board before we open up to the public? Okay. It's an incredible amount of information. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, I'm sorry I went on for so long. I, just, yeah. I didn't want to cheat your information if I never know what's going to be important. <laughs> uh, is there any comment from the public on the presentation regarding the um, uh, open final open space plan? Yes, sir. Uh, um, yeah. And if you just identify yourself yeah, so and where you my live. Name is John Clapp. I live 940 Chesterfield Road in Florence. And first, I want to uh, applaud Wayne for getting 25% of the property in Northampton under restriction or under uh, conservation. And, and I agree with 99% uh, of what he's, what he's proposing. And my opposition is to hunting. And that's what my, my talk is. It's, not, it's a short talk. I got it to three minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is a, a, a very decisive. De divisive issue, and I and I know that, and I've gone to meetings, and it, it's a struggle. So uh, I'm totally opposed to hunting on conservation land. The three parcels in question are all enjoyed by hikers. One parcel is designated uh, as a wildlife quarter, and, and maybe more. Hiking and hunting in the same area are incompatible. Every year in Mass, someone is shot by a hunter. Just Google hunting accidents in Mass for a full list. Two years ago, a man was shot twice while out jogging with his dog. This was on the Cape. Um, the hunter claimed that he thought he was shooting at a herd of running deer. 
uh, this year a hunter was shot by another while, uh, while turkey hunting. Bad judgment happens. Though there has been no fatalities in mass, a woman was in New York State was killed by a deer hunter last year. Mistakes and miscalculations are made even by cautious hunters. Opening uh, this hunting area, this hiking area to hunting only increases the chances of more accidents. Um, there is no shortage of hunting areas in Northampton. One only needs to drive around rural Northampton, Southampton, West Hampton, Williamsburg, and Chesterfield and beyond on opening a deer hunting day and you will see dozens of pickups parked on unposted private land as well as public land. I understand that they're taking away land each year, uh, but there's still a lot, a lot of hundreds of acres that they can hunt on. Um, people are opposed to the change in open space use. Uh, dozens of people have written to city councilors in opposition to opening these parcels to hunting, not one in support. The majority of letters to the editor have been in opposition to hunting by two to one. There is a false equivalency that hunters use that there is less chance of being killed during hunting season than driving a car. The difference is that one chooses to drive a car and knows the risk. No one chooses to be shot while hiking. Less than 1% of the population in Northampton are hunters. Uh, there are more people who, who want to hike these lands free of sounds of gunshots and without the fear of another hunting accident. Personally, I have had negative experiences with hunters who have shot through my, or torn down my no trespassing signs or have illegally installed tree stands on our private land. I am, uh, my, my land is adjacent to the Mineral Hills property and uh, uh, 50 feet away from the access to the proposed hunting land uh, is my property and it's probably 1800 feet from where they can actually do hunting. And just a side note, we have a bed and breakfast. And at uh, a distance of, I think, 500 feet where you can hear shotguns, we're less than a quarter of a mile. So anybody that's out to my bed and breakfast for peace and quiet, they hear a gunshot, they're not coming back. Okay. Uh, and uh, this plan was rejected five years ago because it was unpopular uh, and it would alienate donors and people who put their land into conservation and wanted it used as part of a wildlife corridor for hiking and needs to be rejected again for the same reason. Um, my suggestion would be if there's land that comes up for sale and the, whether it's the hunters or whoever can lobby about that, as long as it's not on an existing hiking trail, I have no tr trouble with them going and finding places where they can hunt. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any land that's available or if it's going to come out, but um, I, I'm really concerned about people hunting and hiking on the same path. And this, and this property that I'm talking about, um, there's a, there are many, many hikers that, who enjoy it. And, uh, and it's uh, basically a, a line, that, uh, a path that starts at Chesterfield Road and goes south about two miles to Turkey Hill. And uh, there's, other, there's parts that are used more than others, um, but at this point, and my wife will talk more about it, uh, we're, we're, we've come up with some alternative uses for that property, um, the, the property that uh, Northampton owns. So thank you for your uh, consideration. And I'd like to give a copy to you know, the chair. Or, sure. Uh, one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. So I, I'm Bob Sproul. I'm a coordinator of the Friends of Mineral Hills, and I, I mean, it's a great plan. I, it's really nice to have a plan like this for, for Northampton. I think it quite nicely reflects the spirit of Northampton. As you mentioned, the hunting business has eluded consensus. As you turn it over to CONSCOM, I would like to see Wayne, the, the plan, and perhaps you, uh, give CONSCOM a mandate to treat this perhaps differently than they have in the past in a several respects. One is there are arguments often made about what the current use of these properties is. We have no data. How are we going to start to actually get data? Uh, I think it would be better to have data than to be making claims that no one can really substantiate. 
Uh, a second thing we have is we have no mechanism to record complaints or to, um, or to really enforce any rules that are in effect, and there are many now around conservation land, around ATV use, for example. There's a lot of, I think uh, Wayne mentioned there's snowmobile misuse in the Mineral Hills area. And uh, there, I'm sure there are people who would r record that and note it and be happy to lodge complaints or uh, on both sides, but there's no mechanism for that. And I think that if we go forward to a more active, uh, I'm, I'm inferring from Wayne's suggestion, I think it's a good one that CONSCOM take a more active role, not, every, not just every seven years, in, settings, in setting rules. I think we ought to have a better basis on which the rules are set. And a similar thing, and I don't have a specific suggestion here, is how best to, if the idea is to serve the needs of the community, how to measure what the community thinks those needs are. Um, in some sense, we're having here tonight and at Wayne's earlier meeting, and I can bet we'll have it at CONSCOM as well, a debate among the vocals, not necessarily a an estimate of how the public feels. And I would hate that the vocals, and I'm a vocal too, I would hate that the vocals somehow dominate the people who actually are in the position to make the best use of these lands. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, my name is Jane Potter, um, 42 Phillips Place, but I'm also involved with the Meadow City Conservation Coalition and really want to applaud Wayne for this incredible plan. and feel really honored um, along with Broadbrook Coalition and some of the other volunteer organizations to help steward the land. A um, couple things that I just wanted to point to quickly is, you know, on some of the lands that are not yet stewarded by organizations that might not be as organized yet as mine, we're a 501c3 and Broadbrook, which is ahead of us and gave us a lot of mentoring. Um, it's, it's not, I would like you to think that once those lands get properly stewarded, and we're happy to help with that, there'll be more public using it. So when we're thinking now about less used lands might be used for hunting, if we have the chance to help build trails there, these are beautiful pieces of property, um, they will be open to public access. So I, I just really want to make sure that everybody understands that we as volunteer organizations are really happy to help with this. We've been doing it. And we'd love to continue to do it and build trails so that more people can get out on these parcels, some of which are just gems. They're gorgeous. Um, so I, I would really like that on the table. The other thing is we've been doing a little bit of research, some of friends speaking here, um, over the winter on hunting. And you know, to echo what you've said, there's 1% of the population who are hunters. We've noted that there were 267 hunting licenses given in 2017. Um, it's a vocal contingent. I respect that. But what we'd like to do is open the discussion, um, and we've started to do that, such that the rec department, arts associations, the schools, um, they have uh, special Fridays where they're out at sawmills and minerals, um, the senior center, music organizations. I mean, there's so many opportunities for public use in this space, in all the spaces that we have. We've started discussions with these groups. They're all really excited about this. They're not at the table yet. We, you know, we have these open hearings, and it's the 1% of the hunters, and it's the, you know, everybody else. But it would be nice to expand the framework, expand the discussion, and let other people contribute their ideas. Because really, we, you know, there's so many things we could do out there with kids, with seniors, with educational outreach, just getting people out. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm Dee Boyle Clapp. I live at 940 Chesterfield Road. Um, I'm married to John. We have a llama farm on land that has been in John's family for 200 years. This includes the Mineral Hills piece that was sold and that was up on that property. Wayne, I'd just like to ask you, is, it, is Mineral Hills off of this list now permanently? That's, that's recommendation. Off the list. So the properties that we're really mostly concerned with now are the two that are in Leeds, which are the uh, Broadbrook Colt, I'm sorry, the um, Beaverbrook and also the, what they consider the Girl Scouts properties. I am absolutely just want to be very clear that I am absolutely opposed to hunting in any of these areas. I think it's a terrible idea. 
to invite people with guns near our children or our pets. I just want everybody in this room to understand that those of us who live near these properties have really endured a lot from hunters. Even though lands are posted, hunters have torn off our signs, they've helped themselves to our property, they've been rude, they've been obnoxious, and they're scary. I'm also one of those folks that um, understands from some of this effort that we've all been putting in that there, the rules are that people have to stay 500 feet from a home. Actually, we have seen snow tracks. Hunters have come within 100 feet of our house. They're gonna not respect the boundaries. All that happens in Northampton or in, in Massachusetts for, in terms of rules are that land has to be posted to remain hunting free. Hunters tear down signs. Then they say, ha, 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 there are no signs here, and they walk in and they help themselves. This has been an issue not only in Northampton, but it's been a problem in Williamsburg and in all the other towns around here. One of the, um, one of the issues that happened is that the, the Gazette, and I'm giving you guys a copy in a second, wrote an article about some of those of us who are concerned and were opposed to hunting. After that article appeared, many people started to call our house. And they said, thank God you're working on this. We are, we are intimidated by the hunters. We're enduring the same issues that you are. People tearing down our signs. They're vandalizing our spaces. They're hunting on our property, even though we have it posted as no hunting. So my concern about opening any of the lands in Northampton to hunting, even though there's less than 1% of the folks in Northampton who hunt, is that we are opening ourselves also to those people. And in dealing with um, a FOIA, we've learned that there are over 1,000 people who hunt in the surrounding area. Some of these folks are the people that are doing this damage, that are, that are not paying and that are not respectful. So that's an issue that I'm very concerned about as well. Um, I spoke to the environmental police, and they said that they cannot possibly border, um, they cannot possibly control all of the lands that are available for hunting, and that they too are very concerned. Um, they said what I should do when I see somebody tearing down my signs, or if I see somebody poaching, or see them hunting on conservation land, is I am supposed to follow them to their cars, get their license plate number, and then call them in. That is not exactly the safest thing that one can imagine having to do. So I really am very concerned about this. I'm also quite frankly concerned about kicking this decision to Conservation Commission. If you have ever sat in those meetings where one side of the room is full of hunters or pro-hunting, the other side is anti, it is so stressful. It's horrible. There can really be very little consensus with this issue. I am 100% convinced, however, that the best use of these properties is to open this up to other ideas, positive ideas that will make a positive difference for Northampton. Um, we've identified a few. Lisa did a great job. Um, Three of the ideas that we had was to include a Forest Fridays program for LEED school. The LEED's principal has said, please do it. In fact, he handed my husband a grant application to please get him a bus. Um, the art in the, there's a concept for an art in the park. I teach arts management. My students would love to curate this. My dean has given me approval. Um, we want a Words in the Woods book program where you sec sections of books and make kids walk from section to section. If your toddler has never wanted to walk, you know exactly what I mean. Um, finally, yes, to, we, I'd like to see Food for All, which has said, yes, they're very interested in helping plant native species that are food crops, food plants for human beings, that we can actually help, help with that. And also UMass permaculture students have said that they would be very interested in helping to create an exhibition garden in all of these spaces. We just have to ask, we just have to open this up to positive uses and not negative uses. And I truly am one of those people that believes that hunting, hiking, and all of the ideas that we've had, are not, they're not compatible, and I hope you guys say no. So I'm gonna just leave this for you. These are actually, um, Conservation Commission, I'm sorry, conservation restrictions and wildlife disorder information, and also um, some of the emails that we saw that went to the city. They were all opposed. There were only those of the uh, those in favor. There were three asked. I'm sorry, those were opposed to hunting. There were three in favor and one refusal. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name's uh, Dave Herships. I live at uh, 22 uh, Warburton Way in Northampton. Uh, I, along with my colleagues, uh, would like to address this, uh, the issue of hunting uh, on conservation land. And Wayne has done uh, an amazing job of preserving land in Northampton. Um, and I, I give him all the credit, and uh, I'm also on the board of the Broadbrook Coalition. I haven't, uh, which supports these issues of no, no hunting and conservation land. I, I, my comments are, are mine. I haven't had a chance to uh, run them by my colleagues. Uh, but I, I would like to uh, suggest that the, uh, the planning board consider that there really isn't that much room to allow hunting on conservation land. 
in, in Northampton anymore. And, to, and this is really listening to the comments and reading them in the paper by the hunters. They are acting like they are being, in fact, they've, they've said that they're being um, uh, picked on, so to speak, and that there's no place left to hunt. And in fact, there is a significant amount of hunting available in western Massachusetts land that, that is set aside for hunting, in particular the, uh, the Mass Department of Fisheries and Wildlife has, has purchased over the years over 200,000 acres of land, uh, which is used for, primarily used for hunting, and, and the hunting community is well aware of it. And if you go on the, the Mass Wildlife website, they have a very good uh, website which identifies the property, shows you where you can park, the kind of game that's that's there. They some of the areas they they stock with with uh, game birds, pheasants, and so forth. And uh, I, I just jotted down a, a couple of these. The uh, uh, most of that 200,000 acres, I think, is certainly uh, probably well over half is is west of of the Quabbin Reservoir. Uh, for example, the Hiram uh, H. Fox Wildlife Management Area, 3,900 acres, which is more more land that's available uh, in, than in Northampton. I guess you're, you haven't quite hit the 4,000 <laughs> acre mark, but uh, Wayne's on his way. And uh, the Hiram Fox Wildlife Management Area is in the towns of Chester, Chesterfield, Huntington, and Worthington. And so if a hunter has to get in his car um, and drive half hour, 45 minutes to get there, and there's, there's literally dozens of air, wildlife management areas, and I'll just mention a couple of Fox Den Wildlife Management Area, 4,900 acres, towns of Chesterfield and Middleton, Tacoa Mountain Wildlife Management Area, 1,380 acres in the towns of Montgomery and Russell, Hinsdale Flats Wildlife Management Area, 1,370 acres, um, Hillsdale and Washington, uh, Peru Wildlife Management Area, 4,700 acres in Peru and Windsor. Uh, Eugene D. Moran Wildlife Management Area, 2,400 acres, the town of Windsor. Savoy Wildlife Management Area, 1,283 acres, Savoy and Windsor. Brushy Mountain, that, this is... I think you've made your point. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's just west of the Connecticut. On the east side of the, of the, of the uh, Connecticut, you have uh, um, Brushy Mountain, 3,500 acres, and, and that's in uh, Sunderland and Leverett. Uh, the, the Holyoke Range State Park, 3,000 acres, 15 minutes from here. If you've been to Atkins Farm, right up the road is, is the, uh, is the, uh, the uh, uh, Holyoke Range State Park where there's hunting, and on and on and on. And if that's not enough, the state forest. I understand, but we're, we're here to talk about the Northampton right. plan. Uh, you haven't hit my, your four-hour mark yet. <laughs> no, well, no, it affects Northampton because these are places that the hunters can hunt. They're saying we don't have any place to hunt. Well, they do have places to hunt, and on and on. And if, if the state the state forests aren't enough, they can hunt in the state parks. Thank you. Thank you. John, can I ask a procedure? Sure. So, I don't know whether everybody remaining in the room or nobody wants to talk about hunting, but given the degree of controversy and the amount of hours of discussion that it's occupied at other meetings. Are, is this going to be our focus here on the, in reviewing this plan? I, well, I don't know where we're going with it. Well, we're, if the public is here, the public has the right and, you know, we have public comment. So the public gets to decide what the focus will be of their comments. Doesn't mean it's the focus of our comments. Uh, but the public is here, and, and this is the forum by which they have an opportunity to speak. So I feel like we need to give them that opportunity since this is the forum which has been created for them to do that. I understand it's happened in other places, but I, you know, we're trying to keep people moving along. And, you know, if that's the topic that's on the public's mind, then that seems to be the topic we'll listen to at least until they've exhausted that. So I, I will remind folks that if you have the same point to make that it, you know, it, it doesn't need to be made multiple times. Uh, you know, we, I think we've heard a lot of that. So if you have something to contribute, we certainly would be glad to have you speak. Thank you. I'm Sandy Glenn and I live in Leeds. And um, 
so it, because there wasn't anything presented in writing before coming here, it was really hard to know what I was gonna actually say. And it's not until hearing stuff that um, some stuff has started to formulate a, a little bit better. I guess um, for me, what I would ask I understood that this meeting was a meeting for you to give feedback to the planning department, to Wayne Fiden, about the open space plan. And I guess I would ask that the feedback be that there be no expansion of hunting on city conservation land because any hiking is completely incompatible with hunting. Um, and. Um, and one of the things in terms of what uh, Wayne Fiden said, it makes it sound, you know, when he talks about hunters and non-hunters or people opposed to the hunting, and I'm not opposed to hunting itself, um, uh, but it makes it sound like they're almost equal numbers, um, and they're not. Uh, it's been said it's less than 1% of the population, but it's not equal at all. Uh, most people are, really uh, terrified of, I won't hike at all where there are, where hunting is going on. And I am an avid hiker, walker, like to snowshoe and cross country ski. And so, um, yeah, I'd like to make very clear that I would like you to consider the feedback being, please, uh, the, the uh, uses of hiking or snowmobiling or and hunting are completely incompatible and to not expand any hunting on the precious and very, even though it's 25%, it's still very dear. It's still not all that great. Um, and so I would ask uh, for no expansion of hunting on any city conservation land. I understand it's currently at Rainbow Beach and well, apparently that seems to be okay. I do want to read from parts of a letter that I prepared um, uh, and I'll try to, you know, pick and choose. Um, I'm a Leeds resident and I understand that these two parcels in Leeds are being considered for hunting uh, being added there. I think one of them has bow hunting right now, but um, the plan or a possibility is to add firearm hunting and bow hunting in one area and firearm hunting to another area that currently has bow hunting. And um, many, many people are adamantly opposed to this. Uh, I saw that some of the criteria that Wayne, so I don't think there should be any criteria. I think if it's city conservation land, it's inconsistent with the current uses of passive recreation. Um, but the criteria that he presented was, um, I think, density, you know, uh, of people and how much is being used. So in terms of how much it's being used, I won't really speak to that because other people have brought up that, well, essentially, I understand that they've been recently acquired in terms of the great scheme of things. And uh, my understanding is that Broadbrook is planning trails for one of them. So they're just, you know, and there, so there's um, ideas and there are actually plans in place to make greater use of it by hikers, walkers, um, things like that. So um, it would be, it, it does, it's not a criteria that makes any sense for properties that are just fairly recently acquired and now need to be you know, made better use of by the wider public. Um, however, in addition, in terms of um, the, whether the conservation land is near a neighborhood, um, I will start to read from what I've written, and I'll, I'm gonna hand this out to folks. Um, let's see. Um, hunting with firearms should absolutely be prohibited from the two Leeds conservation areas. Um, by the way, their names, uh, as I know them, are the uh, Beaver Brook Conservation Area and the Girl Scouts Conservation Area. Um, very close to these two conservation areas and right in the middle of these two conservation areas is Linda Manor's Assisted Living Buildings and Linda Manor's nursing home for patients needing hospice care, 
skilled nursing care, and care for Alzheimer and dementia patients. I have provided with this letter a map used by the planning department depicting the area. The map illustrates the proximity of Linda Manor to the conservation areas and thus the public safety risk posed by hunting with firearms near this densely populated area with vulnerable people. Um, despite Hunter's claims to the contrary, Hunting poses dangers of serious harm to people outside of the hunting area, as evidenced by two news reports I'm including with this letter. And in my view, even one person unnecessarily harmed is one too many. Um, I go on to say, as a taxpayer, I wonder how much the city would open itself up to liability on two grounds if it expanded hunting to the conservation lands. Um, the first ground could be for recklessness in allowing firearm hunting so near to residents if a resident, staff, or visitor is harmed. Secondly, I know of a woman who has a mother at Linda Manor, and that woman was disturbed to hear the city might allow hunting nearby. I think it would be very understandable and foreseeable if Linda Manor's business began to suffer because people were unwilling to go to a facility so near to hunting grounds. Accordingly, I wonder if, a, if Linda Manor could sue the city or its officials for granting special permits to build the Linda Manor facilities there and then without adequate notice allowing hunting with firearms on a neighboring properties. Um, in terms of how many areas um, hunters have, I did research on this. And hunters can hunt on all private lands that don't have no hunting signs, as long as they remain 500 feet away from an occupied dwelling and 150 feet away from any state or hard surfaced highway under General Laws Chapter 131, Sections 36 and 58. Other people already spoke about all the other, you know, wildlife management areas, et cetera, that they have. And they don't need these little parcels in Leeds so near to Linda Manor and to me. Um, let's see. Um, OK. I'll, I'll remind you of the hour and all right, the just a length little of bit. your presentation. Thank you. um, anything else? Um, Okay, I think, um, well, and so I just want to end with, in light of these and other reasons, which include environmental and wildlife reasons, I would ask you to give feedback of uh, not allowing hunting on conservation lands any more than already exists. Um, and I'll pass this out, which has a map showing how close these two uh, conservation lands are to Linda Manor. And so I think this is the one I've signed with my original John Hancock for Thank you. you. Carolyn, shall I read you one? Sure. My name is Lisa Asapowitz, and I'm from 23 Golden Drive in Florence. And I had some comments, but actually, um, seeing the and, and Wayne, you've done a wonderful job with the open space plan, and um, and you know how thrilled I was with the Sawmill Hills parcel. And I've been um, I've been involved with the Friends of the Sawmill Hills from its inception. Um, but um, one of the one of the slides, um, the hunting no hunting framework. Um, I just, I just wanted to say the adverse uh, environment impacts under hunting, you say none. And I, I respectfully disagree with that. Um, I, I do think that, that noise pollution um, is an adverse environmental impact. 
And um, considering the fact that we're going to create a, an old lead mine, you know, an area out of an old lead mine, but try and keep children out, I don't see how that's compatible with allowing people to spray a conservation area with lead, um, you know, bullets, guns, and things like that. So I, I just was, I have a question about that, and I, I don't agree that there is no um, environmental impact um, from hunting, and, and maybe, you know, somebody who's more expert in that could um, talk about it as well. But um, I just want to say what those people said. But also, um, one of my concerns um, with the expanded hunting, um, and I, I'm taking issue with the argument that hunters are taxpayers and are being denied their right to shoot and kill in open spaces paid for by their tax dollars. Um, in fact, no one is being denied the right to use these lands. They're open to everyone for all kinds of passive activities. Um, however, expanded hunting would mean that an arguably larger segment of local taxpayers who use these lands for peaceful recreations will be denied um, their use for the duration of the various hunting seasons, whatever you know we decide, and hopefully we will decide on none. Um, you know, people are just concerned about being you know killed on their hike. Um, additionally, taxpayers like me, whose property abuts the proposed hunt, well, actually, my property doesn't abut a proposed hunting area, but my property abuts a conservation area that may be targeted. Um, in the future, you know, for the next uh, proposal by hunters. Um, people whose property abut the proposed hunting areas and other conservation areas, like my family's, will effectively be denied the peaceful enjoyment of our backyards while hunting takes place. Um, when hunting was allowed um, near my home in the hill towns, we didn't go anywhere outside when we were children because we knew that there were people with guns out there. I would hate to see that happen to anyone in Northampton. Um, and in our case, occasionally hikers wander accidentally into our backyard after becoming disoriented in the woods. The consequence of someone with a weapon coming close to our property could lead to something much more tragic than giving directions back to the individual's vehicle. There's just no way that we can keep hunters in the little parcels that are being proposed. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to go on, um, but I just want to um, you know, bring up those those points and I know that by allowing hunting you know we might get a few extra dollars um, through grants but I really don't think that we're that kind of a community that will you know allow you know hunting guns gun violence in our conservation areas I don't think it belongs uh, in our conservation areas I don't think that as a community we should be um, promoting that kind of um, activity in our public lands so thank you for listening thank you Yes, ma'am. Hi. I um, first of all, I broke my nose a few days ago, and suffered a concussion. So that's why I look like this. I just feel like I have to <laughs> tell people. Um, and because of my concussive state, I have notes that I um, unfortunately will have to read. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to, I'm Elisa Klein. I uh, live at 18 Chestnut Avenue in Leeds. I'm also the Ward 7 City Councilor. Um, I want to say thank you so much to the Planning Board because I know what it is to sit here and to listen to a lot of public comment and how much time you put in. And you guys deal with incredibly complex matters and work really hard so i'm very appreciative of your public service and i also want to say thank you Wayne, because that plan is quite remarkable and the work that you've done over your 30 years here is just amazing um i know that the conscom isn't the final address for this i know that the hunt the sorry the planning board is not the final address for us for this issue of hunting um it is the conscom but um, as Sandy noted, we were told that this was an opportunity for the planning board to give feedback to Wayne. And so we wanted to be heard so that you will consider giving feedback that is very specific to the hunting piece of the open space plan. Um, so we're talking about two parcels really, both in Leeds, which is the area that I represent. One is a 90 acre section of Beaverbrook Greenway, as it has been discussed, and a 40 acre parcel near Haydenville Road that is called the Girl Scouts parcel. Both of these are in Ward 7, and it's an area, um, Leeds is an area that people move to because it is semi-rural, it's a place where they can be in nature, they can be close to conservation areas, they can go hiking. 
Um, I thought it was interesting when Wayne talked about the four-tenths of a mile walking distance to um, conservation areas, open space. Um, that's what these, rep these parcels represent for people in Leeds. And if, even if they're four-tenths of a mile, but they're not going to go to them because they're worried about hunting, it kind of defeats the purpose of the four-tenths of a mile. Um, so I was going to kind of do cleanup because I've heard from so many people, especially in Ward 7, especially in Leeds, adjacent to these properties. So I'm going to go through the notes that I have, and some of them are going to be reiterating points that have been made. So um, it just might take me a minute. I apologize. Uh, so Linda Manor, I think, is a really important point. Um, it's fragile people who are post-traumatic situations, um, post-surgery living um, very close in between these two parcels of land that could be areas where shooting will take place. Um, the sound of gunshots, we've done a bunch of research about this. It, of course, um, the sound of gunshots is affected by terrain, but generally with no terrain or sound absorbing trees and hills and things like that, gunshots can be heard as much as eight to 12 miles away with interferences like trees and hills and things like that, but also um, wind and other atmospheric effects, uh, gunshots can be heard as much as five to six miles away. So just think about being living in an assisted living facility or an um, acute care facility in between two parcels where shooting could take place when it really is, this sound can travel five to 12 miles. Um, hunting in Massachusetts is allowed for a maximum of 217 days in the year, from an hour before sunrise to an hour after sunset. So during um, daylight time, we, we're talking about a 15-hour period in a day that, that shooting of guns can be happening. Um, so think about 15 hours in a day with um, the sound traveling up to 12 miles from where the shooting is taking place. Um, let's see. I wanted to mention that um, there is a site in the Beaverbrook, Beaverbrook Greenway that the LEED Civic Association that I'm quite affiliated with and the Broadbrook Coalition received CPA funding um, to create a portion of this conservation area as a recreation, a passive recreation area. Um, so they've been building a wildlife viewing blind every nice weekend over the last year. They've been going out there and clearing the space with CPA dollars. And this is right in the same parcel that we're talking about for hunting. So those are very, I think, conflictual um, expectations of the city that we could potentially have hunting as much as 217, 217 days out of the year in a place where we have civic organizations prep, prepping the area for passive recreational purposes. Um, this has been touched on a little bit, but I want to talk about the concept of conservation areas being um, established partly as preservation areas for wildlife. Um, because of development, <clears throat> we've done away with a lot of the areas where wildlife can exist. Um, and so if now that we've created, we're trying to link up all of these conservation areas in the city so that there's a wildlife corridor so animals can rotate freely around the city. And making two of those parcels that are part of that connection into places where people hunt is essentially setting those animals up that we were trying to create safe space for to be hunted. Um, in December, you may have heard, we, uh, I worked with the Leeds Civic Association to conduct a community forum where we had over 100 people. The vast majority came to speak out against hunting. Many of them uh, wrote to me afterwards with their comments if they didn't feel comfortable speaking. <clears throat> Probably 90% of the comments that we heard and then the feedback that I got personally was against hunting. Um, and I just wanted to kind of review some of the things that haven't been said yet that people shared about why they were against hunting. Um, they're concerned about gun use in public areas, especially in this day and age when guns are used in, um, in ways that are extraordinarily threatening and dangerous with um, massacres in schools and so forth. 
Gunshot sounds are frightening and disturbing to abutters, children, and pets in particular. Um, hunters can't always, and this has been touched upon, hunters can't always distinguish the boundaries of a hunting area. It's impossible to completely um, seamlessly demarcate the boundaries of a hunting area completely. A number of people in Ward 7 have talked to talked at that meeting, but also talked to me personally about people coming into their yards, onto their property, um, not understanding where they can and can't hunt, putting their children and themselves in danger. Um, trying to be judicious here and choosing what I'm going to share with you because I know it's getting late. Um, a Leeds resident with four young children and two dogs contacted me after the public meeting. She talked about how they used to live on a street off of one of the cul-de-sacs off of Ryan Road. Um, they were very disturbed. Their kids were really scared and their animals were really scared of the sounds that were coming from the hunting range, not the hunting range, sorry, the uh, shooting range up above Ryan Road. They left that area because of that and they moved to Leeds up into the new Beaverbrook development only to find out that the adjacent parcels, not exactly adjacent, but close enough that they will hear the sounds of shooting um, are being considered. Um, their whole point of moving from that area was to get away from gunshot sounds. Uh, hiker, biker, dog safety was just a repeated concern. Uh, in the United States, there are a thousand hunting fatalities per year. Uh, one person did research and shared with me. Um, I just wanted to address something, too, that Wayne said this evening um, in response to Mr. Verson's question about, uh, about taxes. So if we have a lot of conservation areas in Northampton, property values go up. There is a supposition that property values will go up. But if you consider the properties that are immediate abutters or even within um, the sound of gunshots to these hunting, these proposed hunting areas, that can't be good for their property values. And I'm concerned that we could see a decrease in the property values of the homes that are adjacent to these, uh, these hunting areas if hunting takes place. Um, I think I will end it there, but I am very happy to be a resource just because I have talked to so many people in Ward 7 that live close to these proposed areas. So please uh, feel free to contact me if I can be of help. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Wayne, can I ask a question? Um, so the beginning of folks' comments, um, people were kind of talking in general, but then the, my fellow Leeds residents uh, were much more specific. So is there a list of properties? I mean, I, I guess I'm not understanding. Is there a list somewhere like these are the properties that are being considered, or is it just any property that's not not on the list that, that yeah. that's a little bit of where i was going with the earlier but like you know it's like hard to know you know is there a list is there not a list is it just those five areas is it right so, so be, i mean in essence i was trying to go as far as there seemed to be some consensus in eliminating property so it, the goal was basically to turn it over to the conservation commission for their discussion mm -hmm. they may eliminate everything or they may not eliminate everything but okay we just didn't go there and in the spirit of full disclosure, I will say that I actually live between these two properties. I live next to, to Linda Manor. My property actually abuts the Girl Scouts property. <laughs> so I just, in the spirit of, you know, I, I'm very familiar with this area. Um, I am a former hunter, uh, and, and I would have many of the same concerns just as a resident that, you know, Route 9, I mean, it's dangerous enough every day I drive by the golf course twice a day. <laughs> a little something more dangerous than golf balls would be a little scarier, but yeah, it's the same, you know, it, it does seem like it's very close. And then, and I, and I do think the comments about Linda Manor and uh, their assisted living addition, you know, these are people who are vulnerable, uh, you know, we see them, you know, and, and you know, many of them are perfectly healthy and can take care of themselves, but by definition, it is a vulnerable population. But just be clear, this is it's definitely not a recommendation for yeah. hunting. It's just but, but also, but, but, but if you could come up. <laughs> by only listing five properties, you more or less give the board and the audience the impression that you're abandoning the rest of them, which we don't even know the list. <laughs> I don't know the whole list. Which I, I think was what I was trying to say. Right, like it's very kind of very bluntly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Certainly, the Conservation Commission has the whole list, but you don't in front of right. you, and neither do we. So I feel like, just as somebody who does live in Leeds, but I don't 
abut these properties. I was just at Ryan Road with you last week, and the shooting range across the street, we're in a meeting inside the school, and you can hear it. You know, so I get it for the people at Linda Manor, but by the way it's been presented, that's the way I feel, just yeah. as a resident. Right. That you've singled out these five, which the Broad Brook Coalition is very well represented in Mineral Hills, and so they're there. Don't touch them, because these are the people who work very hard for the city, and the rest of us, I don't know. I don't even know who the rest of them are. Yeah, and I think that was the same. And I think that's really unfair, frankly. And if you would say who you are and where you live. I'm, my name is Elizabeth Glacken, and I live on Leonard Street in Leeds. Oh, okay. So can well, I just clarify Yes, go that? right ahead. So I think, I mean, basically what you saw, there were slides here, and one of the, one of the slides is open space. I mean, one of the goals is open space to serve people. And then within that, what could be part of the plan is just identifying that that part of that goal is to establish a framework for w how these open spaces are going to be managed by the Conservation Commission. So okay. the plan isn't to get into the weeds to figure out which property is going to have hunting and which is not going to have hunting because this safe. is the general mm -hmm. okay. overall umbrella and then you're then the plan says something has to be something should be done to make sure we're serving people and that includes the hunting population but that's a management issue that's a conservation commission issue so yeah. you guys don't need to decide which, which properties property are going to okay. be can i just take a can i move to close public comment and we have a second <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, you guys can decide how you want to do this. This isn't an official, official public hearing right. because yeah. you're not, you know, that we're not voting just, on something. Right. Right. So, however you guys want to hold your discussion is fine. Okay. okay. This is new information. A new request. Uh, okay. <laughs> Very quick. Um, I know that I ask that the feedback be um, no uh, hunting, no expansion of hunting on conservation land. Um, and I know he's listed certain properties. I know that Carolyn Mish just said something about not identifying stuff, but um, I don't know what you're about to do, but I just want to put out there, at a minimum, I would like to see no hunting on the Leeds parcels as feedback. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? All opposed? Motion fails. Discussion by the board. I, I, since we're not actually voting on a on a item, right. do is it would it be appropriate now for us to give our comments to Wayne? Sure. Do they have to be universal? Can it just be by member? Well, do I we mean, we have to have a consensus, or can no? Just be I think you need to have a consensus because otherwise, okay, yeah, okay, <laughs> is there how to take, yeah. okay, right. so, uh, um, so discussions, comments well, from the board. Yes, yeah, I, I think there's a, f you know, going back to the framework discussion. This isn't just for existing properties; it's for twenty years down the road. So, so five years down the road, seven, or however, no, seven, yeah. however long years, it, right, years. So, so it's a framework that should apply to both, his, you know, previous and future. I just, and I, I think it would be a mistake for us to identify any specific properties that is not within our purview. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't think that's what we're being asked yeah. to do, and I think it would be kind of a slippery slope for us to go down. Yeah. I, and I'll just, I mean, I, I really, and, and I think I appreciate that the peop, people have given very thoughtful comment and, and done a lot of homework. You know, to me, it really, my summation would be two things. One is that hunting and hiking are not compatible so we should try to keep those two activities in different places. Um, and that there doesn't seem to be, at least from the group represented tonight, an interest in expanding any hunting properties. There is already hunting property, if I understand, you know, that's available within the city. There doesn't seem to be anyone clamoring for expanding it. I'm not necessarily saying that it needs to be reduced either, but 
you know, to me, those are the two. Those are the two takeaways I would have, Wayne, from these com. I mean, from the comments, you know, kind of like in a nutshell. These two activities don't really go together, and we don't need to have more hunting grant uh, property. Uh, some people have said they'd like to have none on just any own property. Uh, that I don't know. That may be a fait accompli because of precedent or whatever. But I mean, to me, those were the two things that I heard. I, mean, I heard from from, uh, from most folks. What I what I took out of this is that two words: safety and maintenance. You acquire more, you have to maintain more, and rules and enforcement. That's what I took out of this whole thing. Uh, and I think um, I'd like to see this. I mean, when when you when you come up with the plan, something that gives us a sense of how does that work. I don't know if it's part of it, it could be part of the plan, but uh, how could we know, have a sense that after this more, acquiring more land, how they'll be kept in terms of uh, the use of a gun or not gun or hunt or not hunt, what kind of rules that are being placed? and how we enforce it. Because what I heard about the folks, the hunters, and I'm not crazy about hunting, but that's not the point, is when you hear here, people say that they hear the shots, right? And they, hear, they see hunters take out the signs and all the kind of stuff. How can we enforce it? So, I don't know. That's what I took out of this. So, I have questions about the the trade-offs that we're making here, why we need this sub-goal, and what what we lose by not including hunting at all. I mean, why we even need this sub-goal that the CONSCOM is going to discuss a hunting framework. You know, can we be more explicit about what the trade-off is? Are, are we now ineligible for millions of dollars of grant funding? Or, you know, what what is that trade-off? And, and it, once it's explicit, if everybody is in some something close to consensus about making that trade-off then you know I mean it, it seems to be causing so much conflict that it's important to know why it's even in here as a sub goal so it's, it's not a financial thing we've never received a grant that, that we get points for 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 buying land there are grants mm -hmm. from Fish and Wildlife Service for land you buy for for hunting but we've never received one of those mm -hmm. um, so it's in here because we've heard consistently from hunters, and I think it's actually true, it's a minority of people, but it's a significant minority. We've heard from both hunters in public hearings, and we've heard from uh, property owners saying the biggest concern about us buying land, both land we bought already and future land, is that they think this is part of their tradition, mm -hmm. and it's important for them for keeping it. So mm -hmm. that, that's why it's in in terms of serving different populations. It's just interesting. I mean, I just, uh, yeah, I feel like there are many other populations that could just as easily kind of crop up and, you know, make their voices heard and, you know, the disabled community or other people. I know they're also referenced, but, you know, it just, it's, it's interesting that it's, it is causing so much conflict and it's, um, yeah, I, I'm, it doesn't necessarily feels like there may be some other path that, what is the trade-off if it were not included? What what is the impact on that population, and what is their recourse? I mean, they still have access to hunting land, but yeah, I don't know what their so, response would be. So, where are the hunters here? Well, we've heard hunters at other meetings. I mean, I mean I, I, that's my exposure yeah, to I mean, the whole it's issue. It's, so, it's a smaller percentage of town, and they clearly aren't as well organized. But you, there have been letters to the editor. Um, you know, there have been hunters involved in the process. And, and I guess, so to, again, you know, I don't really care whether you're out hunting or not, but the extent we have a bias is we identify as many different stakeholder groups as we can and figure out ways to serve all those different populations that are out yeah, there. I agree with you. It's just I thought it was interesting that I don't see a hunter here today. And well, th well, that's the thing. This wasn't set up yeah. to be right. a discussion about hunting. Yeah, but so <laughs> that's right. why, I mean, that's where uh, conservation... You no know, hunters came yet. <laughs> there, was no, there was no outreach to say, hey, we're going to talk right. about hunting it tonight. Just, so uh, you're hearing a few voices on one side, uh, right. and the whole point is Conservation yeah. Commission is the manager of that the op issue. of the open space parcel. So, for y for, so I think it's important to just keep that in mind when you're thinking about the policy and saying, you know, this 
needs more discussion instead of weighing in on a discussion based on the voices that have shown up you know for this one thing i I don't i don't i don't understand procedurally what we're doing um (laughs) the wayne has presented a plan and and asked for our support for it although he's asked for our feedback preliminary he's he's coming back with something more formal but all of this plan says about hunting is that the conservation commission is going to decide so i i just can't figure out what we're talking about well as i understand it which may not be accurate Again, like you said, Wayne made a presentation. He's asked for our input. This is one of the components of the plan. But the component says that the Conservation Commission is going to decide, and certain areas are recommended to be excluded from hunting. There's no recommendation. I mean, if we approve this, do we go on record at all in any way or fashion? Not until he comes. Hunting? Not until he comes back. Uh, if I could add it, I mean, Alan, if you actually, this is. I know the print is too small, but page three in the upper right. So the actual recommendation of the plan is that Conservation Commission should discuss it. It's not a recommendation that they take any action. It doesn't right. say anywhere we should be spending hunting. Just that to the end One thing uh, that uh, I think this is great, and you know, uh, but the notion that somehow. Uh, I mean, one percent is a solid is a solid number, and uh, the notion that somehow a minority group does not have a right to use the land is nonsense. And you know, the the tyranny of the majority is not something that we in Northampton should embrace. And there are lots of people, myself included, who have hiked in lots of places where there's hunting, and. I'm okay, and I would have no problem hiking with my son in a place where there's hunting. And I've done it before, and I'll do it again. So, I mean, it's, we just, we need to take a step back, and the numbers, first of all, are not as clear as 99% and 1%. And more importantly, that 1% are our fellow citizens and have a right to use land as well. So, Wayne, what is it that you need or want from us tonight? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have asked you this question two hours ago. <laughs> what I hope to get in two weeks from now is basically what I just presented in prose, and I'm hoping you're approving it. So, I just, I, I, if there's going to be, if there's things that concern you about hunting, about maintenance, about anything else, I'd like to know it now. Because I'm hoping that you adopt it too. Well, if I, I mean, I'll, you know, what I've heard is that the the big topics are safety, maintenance, and compatibility of use. I mean, you know, if if you're going to inform your plan that you're going to bring back at some point for, those seem to be the the key areas to make sure your plan addresses. I mean, really, around hunting or anything else. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not just hunting, but really about any of the uses, whether it's acquisition or, you know, those, to me, those are the three big topics that have come up. Um, in some ways, about it doesn't really matter whether it's hunting, you know, any of the, to- any of the considerations that you have. Um, Can I add one more to that please. list? I mean, it seemed to me like one other common thread that was discussed, and I'm not necessarily saying for or against this, but just another commonality was people talking about exploring alternate uses of the land. And from my understanding of your presentation, the partnerships that you were talking about exploring were with um, either external organizations or friends of such and such area. But what part of what I heard was partnering with other city commissions and other groups who might want to use the land in other ways. So that's also perhaps something to be built in as something people are interested in that doesn't necessarily Sure. mean one thing or the other about hunting, but just. Okay. Can I just add sound disturbance to that list as well? Yeah, yes, you're certainly welcome to. I, I guess I would have thought that would have fell, fallen under compatibility, but yeah, that, that certainly is a clear. Well, 
so if we if now or in the future we approve this plan i do not see that that constitutes taking a position one way or the other about hunter i don't disagree Makes it easy to so yes. move on. Right. So I think at this point, we might entertain your motion again. Yes! <laughs> yes! Guys, thank you. License is averse. to go to home. <laughs> Seconded by Alan. All in favor? Okay. All opposed? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I hope you got I have no idea if we were helping. <laughs> Okay, we now have... Um, oh, do we? Yes, we still have some other items. Uh, the summer schedule. Yeah, so you guys meet once a month in July and August, and so I think we should probably figure out what what either the second or the fourth Thursday of those months. Not you. <laughs> You're leaving <coughs> us. Um, oh, we're John. <laughs> so besides these two people who are just we abandoning no ship... Still going. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, <laughs> ridiculous. So July and August. So t so dates are July 12th and 26th, or August 9th and wait, did I get that wrong? That's the rumor. That sounds right. 9th and uh, 23rd. Yeah, we should. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, July 12th and 26th, and August 9th and 23rd. So. Um, I don't know what you what if you guys know your vacation schedules and what uh, works better, but uh, I think last year what we said is, do you want the two first Thursdays or the two? And right. so it was, then it made it easier for people to plan right. that hadn't already made their plans yet. Right. So yeah, we're a little bit late on this. So <laughs> sorry. <about that. laughs> Either one, all the dates work. The second Thursdays are better. Uh, okay, so the so twelfth and ninth. Oh, I'm sorry. 26th Fourth. and 23rd. Thank you. I meant the oh, second okay. group of, yes, the 26th and the 26th 23rd. and the 23rd. Yes. So I'm violently opposed to that. Of which month? So July, July and August. July 26th and, 23rd. and August 23rd. So it would be the fourth okay. Thursdays only instead of the second and fourth. Yeah, I'm not here. Okay. Do we have at least five people for the 23rd? Of, of August. Mm, I okay. Um, I mean, could we do the end of July, beginning of August? End of that, July. Well, it doesn't. It's not so much separation. Yeah. But um, I mean, you could, but um, it would be like our old. It'd be the same amount of time as our regular schedule. Well, that's that. true. Yeah. Right. Does that work? <laughs> the twenty sixth and the ninth. August ninth. Of, a of July, July and, and August 9th? Yes. For me. I can make the 26th. I don't think I can make the 9th. Okay. So we'll miss one either way right. of you. I don't know about Mark. Um, so that's one, two, three. Oh my gosh. Four, <laughs> five. Wow, we're damn. Go out and, and Shanghai some people. <laughs> um, all right. Well, why don't we stay? Why don't we set the twenty sixth and the ninth for now, and then I'll send a message out to Mark to see to see if there's any more. Yeah. Um, about that, and we'll just temporarily go with that. Awesome. Uh, would anyone like to move approval of the minutes from April 9th and May the second? Oh yeah. Do I have a second? Yep. yep. Sam. <laughs> All in favor? Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> hey, those minutes have been proved. I move to close wait, the. Wait, <coughs> we don't have any ANRs. Oh, wait. You have it on the list. It's just, just in case. Oh, my gosh. Just in case. You're just and then, what is this? Yeah, what's the last one? So, the last thing is this just came in the other day. The You know the, um, the teen homeless. Um, Shelter oh, on, uh, Locust, on Street. Locust Street. Yeah. Um, they discovered now that they're getting closer to construction. I sat down that um, one of they they were proposing two shade trees at the back of the property. This is Locust Street, 
and then Hatfield here, and the house is gonna be up on Locust Street. Two shade trees were in the back corner. This one shade tree is actually proposed to be within feet of a cluster of coniferous trees that are on the abutting property. So that wasn't picked up in the original at, during design process. So they don't think it's really gonna be a viable location for the shade tree, so they asked if they could take it off the plan. Um, I, it's you know, it's a minor change. We don't, well, we don't require shade trees for residential use, but you might. There may also be another place on the plan that it could be relocated. Um, but at this point, they're asking for just not to be planted. They only do one tree in the back here. So, I said I would bring it to the board. Could we okay. say they need to find someplace else and just put it someplace else? Yeah, I mean, I think there are no trees slated yeah. for the front of the property, and it looks like there's room in the front corner. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just find yeah. something else. Proof. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do I have a motion to okay. that effect? Thanks. A motion to move the tree to the front. Second. Yeah. Alan seconds. Alan seconds. Yeah. All in yeah. favor? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Actually. Anyone have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Last vote. Last motion. Last motion. Last Test last second. Because yep. I do oh my God. Wait. All in favor? Well, I have electronic, but some of this, like these. Yeah.